Hey everybody, Dave here. Just thought that before the episode starts, I want to tell you about a little content warning in this episode. Uh, as the format of the show goes, it's kind of tricky to talk about uh, because giving the content warning right now would spoil the entire game for you, and that's kind of against what this show is all about. Uh, so what I'm doing is the content warning will be right after the spoiler wall. If you check the episode, you'll see a timestamp. Uh, for where that spoiler wall is. If you have any concerns about content in the game uh, that uh, may be distressing or, um, you know, heavy for anybody, please uh, check that content warning. It's right after the spoiler wall. It's the first thing I say after the music break. Please go check that. Look at the timestamp in the episode description uh, if you are at all concerned about any type of content warning. Thank you. Enjoy the show. Hey everybody, my name is Dave Jackson and this is Tales from the Backlog, a video games podcast where I bring in guests to talk about the games we play. My guest today is a friend of the show, a uh, panelist on the wonderful Kane and Rinse podcast, Brian Edwards. Hey Brian. Hey Dave, how you doing? Good man, good to have you on the show. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. I, I, I think more than friend of the show, I think you can officially call me fan of the show. I think I've listened to everyone <laughs> now. Um, I actually had a backlog of Tales from the Backlog, so I was able to sort through that, and now I'm current. So, uh, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Hell yeah. Good to have you, man. It's, uh, it's, it's great having you on the show. I'm a big fan of Kane and Rince, and so in case uh, anyone listening to this isn't really aware of what Kane and Rince is about, can you uh, just explain that for a little bit? Yeah, um, so Kane and Rinse is a podcast um, that's been going on for 10 years now. I've only been a part of it for the last two, um, where basically, um, kind of like um, uh, maybe uh, a little bit more deep dives into individual games. So every episode, or every issue, excuse me, uh, Leon would punch me for not saying <laughs> issue. <laughs> not really, he's the nicest guy in the world. Um, uh, but every issue we cover a different game, and there we basically do 50 episodes a year, and there's a kind of rotating cast of panelists. Um, uh, and yeah, uh, it's primarily based out of the UK, but obviously, if you hear my voice, I'm not from the UK. They they managed to let a couple of us uh, Americans sneak on from time to mm -hmm. time. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that that's where that's where I kind of started doing the whole podcasting thing, and um, and yeah, uh, that's it. Definitely leads right into to your type of show because. Um, because yeah, kind of talking about games on a per game basis is kind of what we do. So it's um yeah, it's it's neat to come and come and do it here. Yeah, Kane and Rince was um a big kind of influence on like the way that I want to talk about games on my show. I've always been a big uh, video gamer, but like when I was thinking about like what kind of podcast I want to do, it it definitely started with um I want to talk about specific games, go in depth on them. Um, sure, but do it yeah. kind of my way. So it was a big, uh, big influence on this show. Uh, so it's it's really great to have you on here. Cool. Well, thanks a lot. Yeah, I I can take no credit for how that show is set up. <laughs> like I said, I came in eight years to it, and I'm just I'm just thrilled to be. A, I'm still thrilled to be a part of. It. I still when they um when the schedule comes out every year and I see what episodes are on, I'm like, oh, I'm on that one. Yeah, all right. So you know, so I get very excited still. Um, but yeah, no, I'm thr thrilled to be here, and I'm also th thrilled to be talking about this game because um this game had a huge impact on me last year. Yeah. So today's game that we're going to be talking about is Before Your Eyes, uh, which is a kind of first person story game. It's kind of hard to describe uh, before I get yeah. to the elevator pitch, uh, but it was developed <laughs> by Goodbye World Games and published by Skybound Games in 2021. And the elevator pitch, if you're listening and you're not sure what Before Your Eyes is all about, is it is a first person narrative and it uses your real webcam in your computer uh, and it registers your blinks. And when you blink, the story advances. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but when I heard that pitch, um, I was, I was honestly, I was kind of like off put because I don't like, you know, things taking control of my webcam is one of those like yeah. conspiracy theory yeah. things, you know? Mm -hmm. um, For sure. But, so when I first heard that, I, I was 
very interested in just like, okay, what are they going to do with this? What is this? What is this game basically? Yeah, I. So to me, it, it immediately felt like it was going to be a some a gimmick game, right? Be like, right. within the first ten minutes, you'd be like, "Oh, I get it," and then it yep. would just kind of <laughs> fade from there. Your interest or whatever. Um, it turned out to be much different than that for my experience, but um, mm-hmm. but yeah, that's the exact way I felt about it. And then uh, when it first came out, I remember it was kind of getting some real effusive praise from people that I really kind of respected. So I was like, oh, maybe there's maybe there's more to this than I initially thought. Same. So I guess we can start with our like personal history with it since you since you brought that up. So what mm-hmm. like what made you want to start playing before your eyes? What got you interested? I I'd be lying. I can't remember who the author was. It's terrible, but Polygon had a feature on uh, before your eyes. And not that I'm blowing myself up, but the video game filter on my work internet doesn't catch polygon maybe oh okay. <laughs> so every once in a while i might i may on a lunch break only of course um i may uh, uh slip on there from time to time i remember reading kind of the like you said the elevator pitch for the game but they were speaking of it way more positively than i probably would have imagined so I, at the time i mean i was probably i had just bought a lap a gaming laptop like mm-hmm. j- like had it for about a like a less than a month so i was already itching for pc games to play and here's this experience that's super unique to the pc you need a webcam to play all the the things you already said so i want to say it was about a month after the game's release i picked it up on steam and then again not knowing really what i was getting into i played it through almost entirely over the course of one evening Um, i kind of just sat down and, and just and played right through it and then i've played through it a couple times since, uh, you know, uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit, you know, trying to keep my eyes open to see things that I might have missed the first time around. Right, exactly. Yeah, um, I kind of had a similar introduction to the game as you, except it was, um, I, I think it was Jacob Geller on YouTube who was uh, talking yeah. just so highly about this game. And I, I yeah. kind of, like... I, I kind of thought like you, like maybe this would be some kind of gimmick that, like you said, after 10 minutes, I'll be like, okay, I understand. It's time to move on. But mm-hmm. I really trust Jacob Geller's opinion. And when he's talking so highly about a game like this, I kind of like yeah. know like, oh, okay, there there is something here because he's not the type of person that would be so excited about a gimmick yeah. like that. Yeah. So yeah, I, I just kind of threw it on my Steam wish list and when it went on sale, not that it's a super expensive game, but I'm a, mm-hmm. I don't know, my brain's broken in that way. When it went on sale, I picked it up. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> no, I'm de- you're not, your brain's not broken. Well, if it is, then we're broken together because I literally today, I was like, oh, the Steam, um, the Steam Next Festival's up. So I know all these, I'm like, I wonder if any games went on sale. So I pull up my wish list, which is just huge and just scroll through <laughs> looking for the, how many percents off I could see to see if I could snag anything. So now yeah. I get that 100%. Well, that's what you get for having a uh, a proper gaming laptop. My wish list <laughs> is is I literally know. everything I want to play on PC uh, that my computer can run, and it's like eight games. So yeah, <laughs> and before your eyes is is one of those. So people listening, if you're you're like me and you have a you know budget PC as they call it, you can probably run before your eyes on uh, low settings. It ran just fine on my computer, which like nice. I have trouble running anything that's you like you know, under 10 years old on my computer. So mm-hmm. that's the <laughs> way I was just fine. Uh, way I was for, for years. And um, so, yeah, no, it definitely wasn't taxing, um, taxing the computer at all. Um, mm-hmm. But it does. And I know I, I'm not trying to jump the gun, but it does kind of have its own unique look to it. So like even the not like, I, I don't care if you were to play this thing on max out settings, I don't think you'd m- like get more or miss anything on either side. You know, it just yeah. kind of has its own feel to it. Yeah, totally agree. I whatever the default settings were when I switched it down to like low settings or lowest or whatever, mm-hmm. I I don't think I could notice a difference, you know? Yeah. So Yeah. Yeah, no worries there. And um for people listening, if you're worried about or wondering how long this game is, um each playthrough takes about an hour and a half to two hours mm-hmm. for me. Sound right to you? Yeah, I think my first one was about two, um, only because I restarted um just like right off the beginning just because it took me a second and we'll talk about the mechanics a lot i'm sure but like w- mm-hmm. once i kind of got how it was working i w- i felt like and and felt kind of the path of it i'm talking less than 10 minutes in years i was still on the boat ride you know at the beginning and i'm mm-hmm. like i'm just gonna go back knowing what i know now and, and do it again so yeah i think it was about two hours for my first playthrough yeah and this isn't 
it's not really a game that you like play at your own pace. So I think that that time is going to hmm, be a, yeah. a pretty consistent thing for everybody. So if you're looking for short games, and I do have a kind of tag I throw on these short indie games, uh, the Lazy hmm. Sunday tag, this is one of those games. Uh, for sure. Games under five hours, uh, indie games especially that I kind of want to highlight. Um, I haven't haven't really seen a lot of uh, shows talking about Before Your Eyes, so I'm happy to um, to get into it. Yeah, yeah, me too. Cool. So let's uh, let's take a little music break. When we come back, we'll get into what Before Your Eyes is all about. So the story in Before Your Eyes is set up in a way, uh, and we are not going to get into um, specific spoiler stuff uh, in the episode before the spoiler wall, as we always do. Um, mm-hmm. We This is a story-heavy game, so like the story talk before the spoiler wall is going to be very light, just kind of setting mm-hmm. up what's going on, uh, as always. But yeah. the story in Before Your Eyes is uh you are playing a character named benny uh you never you wake up you're on this boat like brian said kind of disembodied and you quickly find out that you are uh dead you're in some kind of purgatory of some kind and you have this weird animal that i thought was a cat after the first time i played it then i replayed (laughs) it and i was like no it's definitely a dog but it's not really Mm. a dog it's a kind of (laughs) it's like a like a coyote man type of thing (laughs) happening yeah yeah once he started howling, I was like, okay, more more canine <laughs> than feline for yeah. sure. Um, he is your kind of guide on the boat through uh, this lake purgatory uh, type thing. And uh, he tells you at the beginning that your soul uh, was worth pulling up out of this kind of infinite purgatory sea. And he's taking you to see this uh, character called the gatekeeper to be judged. And what he asks you to do is to relive your entire life, Uh, kind of go through. If your life is worthy enough, uh, you get to go to the good place, I assume. And if Mm -hmm. it's bad and if it's uh, not worthy, well, we don't want to talk about that. So (laughs) let's just not worry about that for now, huh? Yeah, Yeah, he almost seems like he's... Um, and again, this isn't. I don't think this needs a spoiler tag at all for it. It's like he, this doesn't feel like the first time he's tried to bring a soul to the gatekeeper. You know, he's right. like you almost feel like his last chance. Like he's some fight promoter that's like had a bunch of boxers, and he's like, "You're the last <laughs> one, kid." Like we gotta, yeah. we're gonna get through the gatekeeper this time. You know, um, so he definitely has that kind of sense of he has been on this journey before, but but you're yeah. still kind of like, "What? You know, what's going on?" And um, yeah, it sets for a really interesting opening for sure. Yeah, and he the right away you get the idea that this gatekeeper has like this reverence. Like, you don't want to fuck with the gatekeeper. You get that feeling, <laughs> yeah. uh, nope. like at the beginning. And uh, he he's very kind of direct with you. Like, tell the truth about your life. I want to know what happened so we can make mm-hmm. the best case for you. Uh, like that. <laughs> yep. Yeah, like he's gonna be he's gonna be your defense attorney kind of when you're getting when you get right. to this gatekeeper. <laughs> like, hey, the gatekeeper doesn't take any shit. So make sure you lay it out to me straight. What do you uh-huh. do? What do you do wrong? You know, where have you been? What skeletons do you have in the closet? Like those types. Of, he doesn't come out and say it directly like that, but you definitely get that feeling that he's poking and prodding you to find out. You know what? You know what? Re- what really happened in your life? Type of thing. Right. Exactly. So like, that's the story setup. You're just going through this character's life, uh, named Benny, and uh, I am not going to go any further into the story um, because. Mm-hmm. We start getting in. Well, we we start getting into heavy, heavy spoilers uh, much later in the story. But that's all that I want to say. I want people to play this game. Uh, like yeah. I said, this takes uh, you know an hour and a half, two hours of your time. It, if you can't tell by now, Brian and I are both very positive on it. I think you yeah. should play it. Yeah, so. it's it's one of those. Um, I feel like this is kind of becoming, especially with indie games, a trope where not a trope. That's a that's that's the wrong word. I hate that word. But um, kind of like a common theme that you hear, like you want to go into this one knowing as little as possible. Yeah. And in and for most of those games, I I agree. And somewhat like people were saying that a lot about Inscription this past year. And and I played that game and I I liked it a lot. But like I knew a couple things going in, didn't really ruin or mar my experience. But if I knew certain things about Before Your Eyes, I I 
can definitely say I wouldn't have been as, you know, taken aback by it. Um, so, right. so for sure, it's definitely, this is one of those games that I think earns that, you know, if you can go in blind, no pun intended, absolutely <laughs> do. Um, because it's, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's all the better for it. Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, I agree. I'm kind of like, I don't, Inscription's a good example. There's so many people that have brought up Inscription. And like I said mm. before, I have a I have a PC that can't run stuff. It can't run Inscription. So yeah. it's like people are like, Dave, I want to talk to you about Inscription. I'm like, okay, well, I don't I don't know. I want to talk yeah, to you about tell- Inscription, <laughs> but I can't say anything. And I'm like, well, yeah. I can't play it, so Yeah. Bleh. Hopefully, um hopefully <laughs> they get on that that switch port soon. I think that's gonna be a thing that's coming out. But uh Yeah. Um I hope but so. But yeah, this yeah, so like like you said though, like with this one, um I think it being such a short experience. I don't say short short shouldn't be uh detracted. Like, you know, it, it, if anything, it should be an attractive kind of a proposition. It is because to that me. short yeah. yeah, me too. That short experience is so chock full of unique and interesting things in this case. Mm-hmm. Um that I I think it really does it, it it's kind of that model, like you said, lazy Sunday afternoon game. You sit down, you play through it start to finish, and you can kind of have this one core experience with this thing. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and it, and I, I think just from the outset, again, without getting into any spoiler uh, story details, it does, it really has a compelling setup for sure. It does. And, yeah, I guess just without saying too much, and this will be the final thing I say about the story, I, I think the story is really good, and it's something that I've been thinking about since I finished the game, since I finished yeah. the game the first time, and then uh, when we talked about doing this episode, I played it again, and I've mm-hmm. been thinking about it since I did it again. I really think this is a... Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the the main mechanic and how it plays into the story, but these things together it really gives you an experience that is uh, really memorable. Yeah, it has that way of... Um making the mechanic uh, or using the mechanic so and making it so integral to the storytelling that I kind of can't imagine playing it. Like if they say, because this game got a lot of critical praise. So you would think that, Hey, they'd want to port this to as many places, want to have as many people experience it. But even if you, if you translated those controls to a button push or to us, or even like a motion sense thing, I just don't, it just wouldn't have that same, click to it I, it's it's really difficult to explain until you've done it and once you're in it for about 10 minutes you get it and you're like mm-hmm. oh this is this is different you know this is really really unique yeah and so that main mechanic like we mentioned before but time to kind of get into that is uh blinking and the game kind of taps into your webcam on your computer and it it has you go through a calibration and so the way it works is it's not like literally every time you blink, it's specific parts in the story. So a scene will open up, you'll kind of mouse over these icons, you'll blink to like open up more of the scene so you can see more of what's going on or hear more dialogue. And then eventually a metronome starts uh, going on on the screen and that's your cue. The next time you blink, this scene is over and it kind of sets up this like, There's dialogue still going on, and in a lot of the scenes, you are going to blink before you hit the end of uh, dialogue. Mm -hmm. So this is what's going on in in the game is it's it's using this blinking to kind of I don't know it it sets up this thing where like you know like we said the story is the the character's life flashing before their eyes, and this is a situation where the character probably doesn't have control over this too, and the character might want to spend more time in certain scenes and stuff like that, but they can't and neither can you yeah. because like we said the second you blink it moves on yeah exactly and the so it, this is um like you said the setup for it is perfect or the tutorialization of it is perfect because um like you said you can kind of look or blink at things to open up scenes so for for an example without going into any spoilers like if your character's in a car you might look out the window of the car and then, you know, you see that and you blink outside and all of a sudden you can see maybe a city skyline, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But then once that metronome starts going, it is literally the next time you blink, it, mo- it moves. And you, you think you get that when they explain it. But then when you do it on accident for the first time, when your body just naturally blinks, mm-hmm. you have that kind of like pull in your chest moment. Be like, wait, like uh, uh, and and you can't <laughs> get that moment back. And when yep. it does that for the first time, wow, like that, 
that's and I'm not even talking anything about the story. Just like the fact that you couldn't get that back. I'm not reloading a save. I'm not going like it's just like it's it's so well used and well timed. And a lot of times those conversations and or scenes that are kind of playing out are things that if you could get the clockwork orange clamps to keep your eyes open uh-huh. to just see, you'd love to take it all in. But missing out on parts of it is like as much of the journey as cheesy as that sounds. Like it's just, <laughs> it's like that. It has that. That's just that tiniest bit of risk where, you know, if you the minute you blink, you miss it. And and that sounded like the gimmick to me going in. And then when actually playing it, that was like the part of the game that I found maybe the most compelling. You know, it just, it's um yeah. I, I'm sorry if I'm being too too like glowing about it right off the bat, but it's like. Yeah, it it did something really unique, and it's kind of hard not to just buy into that. Yeah, there were a few times in the um in the story where I actually did like hold my eyes open. Um, mm-hmm. my second playthrough, uh, not my first one. Uh, but like you mentioned, the Clockwork Orange thing, because you want to see what's going on. Uh, there's a couple things um I want people to know. Uh, number one, you're not gonna miss like crucial story information if you accidentally right. blink uh they they give that stuff to you before the metronome comes up most of the time or mm-hmm. they give you that stuff in scenes where like uh later on they kind of play with the blink mechanic a little bit yeah and so i just yeah. want people to know like you're you're not going to miss crucial story information because you blinked on accident that's not an issue and mm-hmm. uh the other thing is if you do hold your eyes open like an unnatural amount of time, the game will comment on it. The characters will yeah, say stuff. Yeah, they will. Uh, it's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. The the way it reacts to you attempting to like to circumvent that system or whatever to maybe just get a little more a few more seconds out of it. The game the game is very quick to let you know, like, hey, we know we know you're looking in on something now that you maybe sh- not that you shouldn't be, but just like Oh, you're still here kind of situations, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's pretty pretty neat without really breaking that fourth wall, but just enough to kind of poke it yet to be like, okay, it's okay to blink now, you know, you can uh-huh. you right. Can, you can move on from this. Um yeah, th- so uh, my second time through I did the exact same thing that you're talking about, like just try like those the kind of like get my eyes feel my eyes getting a little red or whatever, uh opening them up. And uh what I found um is that doing that um by the end of the playthrough, I just stopped even trying because it was like almost taking away from that experience a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's so interesting that th- as the further you go on through the game, they start playing with that mechanic and turning it on, not on its head, but just putting you in situations where like or even uncomfortable situations where you might want to blink just yeah. to make that uncomfortable situation stop. And that was a real interesting part of the game to to me, um, because for so long you're just worried about blinking and missing it, and then now you're in, maybe put in a situation where you just want to blink because you you want that to be over. And that right. was a that was a really interesting um, kind of twist on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they definitely like you would think that opening and closing your eyes is an extremely simple thing with very limited you know uses uh, in the mm. game, but they they really thought of everything i think uh in the way that they mix that up a little bit and i'll I'll talk about that after the spoiler wall the ways that they do that but it is uh it's very cool uh brian one question for you though i have to kind of have to address this did this blink mechanic work for you reliably like throughout your entire playthroughs uh yes it did for me um but what i will say is i noticed um so uh, for the the magic of the audio editing for the podcast, you can't see the room I'm in right now is quite dark behind me. There's one light kind of above me. But where uh-huh. I play this is not where I normally record the podcast. It was up, uh, upstairs where I live. And I had a really bright background next to me. And what I would find is that sometimes a reflection or a, or just like a playing of lights might trigger something. So what I found the best way to play this was actually uh, with with no backlight behind me, just kind of the light from the webcam, the the little you know blue light on my face. and And I had... No issues when I did that, but the wall that was behind me was kind of like this really light blue, and it almost registers as white, you know, on the webcam. Um, mm-hmm. So I had a couple issues there, but mostly reliable. Was it was it pretty good for you? So the first time I played it, I got through about half the game uh, with it working fine, and then it just I had some had some issues where I would like I'd go through the calibration, and the calibration mm-hmm. would be perfect, and I would be like, okay, let's start the game, and it just just wouldn't work, and hmm. so I was playing it at um i was playing it at night and 
my apartment is reasonably well lit, I feel like, mm. but uh, they do tell you when you calibrate, like, play in a well lit space, don't do this, don't do that, you know, yeah. um, they have instructions for you. And so the second time I played it, um, I followed those instructions more. I played it during the day. Um, I made sure, like you said, like I kind of turned my setup so that like I was facing the window so the light would come onto my face, yeah. you know, yeah. that helped a lot. Um, so I just do want people to know, like, they're going to give you instructions for like setting up your webcam setup and mm. you should follow those because when the blink mechanic doesn't work, the basically, I don't want to say the game falls apart cause you can still enjoy the story, but your yeah. Yeah. immersion in it will fall apart because the other option, if the blink's not working or if you don't want to blink, you can use a mouse click to advance the story. Yeah. Uh, but I don't recommend that. No, I feel I feel the exact same way. The um, the the the, the couple times it didn't work for me, where you you felt yourself blink and it didn't go. It almost like it kind of jars you right out of that immersion. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It takes you right out of it. And I just think I don't think the story would necessarily be better or worse because of that. But I definitely found myself more invested because you really do. It's it's interesting because there's a lot of first person video games, right? But the, but the lens that you're looking through is always the camera that you're controlling with the mouse or with the keyboard or, or excuse me, or with the controller. But this, when your actual control is your physical eyes blinking, you just feel that much more connected to the protagonist. And mm-hmm. um, and it just, when that, do, for the first time that doesn't work, you're just kind of like, oh, well, that was weird. I blinked. So they should have blinked. You know, it just, um, fortunately, I didn't have too many problems with it, but um. But I did read a couple things in over the last week or so where people, some people described the controls as inconsistent. And um, so I could definitely see that maybe, you know, kind of gumming up your general sense of the game. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was a real shame the first time I played because some of the scenes that would have kind of maximum impact with, uh, you know, the way the blinking works, you just, mm-hmm. you just don't get that same impact when you are, um, like one step removed from like that interactive experience. So yeah, yeah, definitely recommend people um, follow those instructions. Uh, Make sure that you have a good setup to play this game. Uh, You won't regret taking the, you know, the five minutes to get yourself in a good, a good setup for it. Um, Mm -hmm. But I'm like, so you mentioned the next thing I wanted to talk about, which was um, how their first person is like that, that classic thing that video games do when they want you to, well, it's, one reason why they put you in first person but to get you in the you know into your character a little bit more than you know controlling your dark souls character in third person or something like that right and i i just felt like this was an incredible like creative touch using the blink thing to like really put you in the body of the character um like you don't you don't learn a ton like i don't want to uh you you definitely learn about your character but like i I don't know this is a very short game that's what i'm trying to say you're not going to go super super in depth but like just connecting it to your body really makes it like feel like it's almost happening to you in a way that like you know when i play i talked about firewatch on the show before i talked Mm -hmm. about gone home i never thought it was me walking around the house and gone home But in this game, you almost approach that because it is your body. Yeah, that uh, 100%. I think you nailed it right on the head. I I only made a couple notes uh, for tonight's recording, um, and one of them was talking about how I felt like it was me. Like, like to the point where, and I think the story is affecting uh, on a number of levels, especially if you have certain experiences in your own life, um, the the Mm -hmm. story can hit you in a couple different ways. Um, But... Yeah, to really attaching that to your physical actions. And we're not talking about like, like you know, oh, I'm really uh, <laughs> doing the soldier boy and just dance for connect. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Like, like yeah, <laughs> your body was doing all that. But like this had a real like a there's something about the blinking mechanic that added an, an emotional resonance to the playthrough that I frankly wasn't prepared for. Like I've been emotionally affected by games. I go up and down. Sometimes it's normally where I am in life, right? Like, you know, on some, you know, some parts of my life, I could play the most, you know, play the last of us part two and feel next to nothing. And other parts of my life, I hear the opening theme song to kingdom hearts and tears come to my eyes. You know what I mean? So it's like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's a roller coaster, but putting you in that, in that real first person uh, uh, situation 
just it, it just it made every thing that they wanted to hit just hit a little bit harder for me and so which i'm assuming was very much by design because this is another another thing about this game that i think it's very tightly designed because it has to be for the narrative mm-hmm. it's trying to uh to trying to get across yeah so like i often I, when people ask me like why do i love video games so much um because i, I like i I've said it on the show before, I think, but like, I don't watch a lot of movies. I don't watch a lot of Netflix anymore. I I basically, I play games in my free time uh, as well as, you know, podcast stuff and other hobbies and stuff. But like games are my preferred uh, media for entertainment, like by far, like way higher than anything else. And like the, the interaction that like connects you to a video game, even in something like, you know, Dark Souls or, um, games that are not emotionally resonating with people not to say no one resonates with dark souls but you know what i mean um yeah, this that's sure. what i kind of tell people is like this interaction it it hits me and it connects to me in a way that other media just can't do unless it's like the top of the top you know like the best tv show mm-hmm. ever made will hit me the same way that a good video game will hit me it's just yep. you know how i get on with it and this game is like I, the point I'm getting to here is that this game before your eyes is a game that I would recommend to people who don't play video games to understand how interactivity in video games can connect with you in that way. Cause like there, yeah. I'm not going to recommend that my wife who doesn't play video games, I'm not going to recommend that she play almost anything, but I would mm. recommend her to play before your eyes because this is a, yep a unique experience it's not difficult all you have to do is sit there and blink and mm-hmm, you will get sure. that connection yeah that's that that's really well said I, I hadn't made that connection independently but now that you say it out loud it's that's 100 percent right i um it's 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 funny you mentioned gone home because gone home and what remains of edith edith finch are the two games that um my wife actually sat with me while i played through them mm-hmm. um because they do have that like you said, it's it's a it's a first person thing, but you never really believed you were walking around the house and gone home. And I agree with that as much as I like that game. Um, but they naturally drew in my wife, who is a non video gaming person. I mean, she 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 plays the hell out of Tetris Effect Connected, but other than that, she's not really playing much <laughs> else, you know. So right. Um, so but it but it drew her in just because of the nature of the story. So before your eyes is an absolute use case for that because because you're right. It's it's hard to explain to somebody who doesn't feel that way about games like well why do you what what makes them the thing you go to the thing you gravitate to because right. I'm the same way as you if I have 4 hours free on a Friday night and um and then somebody says what do you want to do the answer is always well I want to be diving into a game that I you know a new game or an old game I love whatever I, games are the media I seek out just like you and this is definitely one of those ones that can show pretty much anybody just because of that mechanic the simplicity of it like you don't you don't you're not trying to say somebody hey the witcher 3 has some of the best storytelling of all time but you also need to know how to use dual analog controls make sure you map your spells to the right you know like it's none of that it's just it's sit down it teaches you in very simple fashion how it works and it's very easy to get right off the bat like you know what this game's going to ask of you and that's unique because like I again, not to just talk about just like game after game after game, but like I I'm playing a couple new open world games right now in Dying Light Two and Horizon Zero, uh, Horizon Forbidden West, and I I'm enjoying those games, but the first like five to ten hours of both of those games are just like riddled with new mechanics and new this and new that, and like trying to explain to somebody, oh no, the story of Horizon's really cool. Once you get past all the stuff that you don't know how to do and don't interact with on a regular basis. Before your eyes is the absolute antithesis to that, where it's like sit down, calibrate your thing. All right, this you blink to move on. Good, good. Let's go, and that's pretty cool. Yeah, hundred percent. It's um, it's it's really special. And like, yeah, th- there's not a whole lot of games, even ones that I've covered on this show, even ones that I, you know, loved growing up, that I would recommend to people who don't play video games or like don't mm. like video games. You know. But this is definitely one that I think earns that uh, because yeah. of because uh, of just the the simplicity, like you said. And this is like it just got me thinking about like how I never considered that this form of interaction would be possible in video games, which are 
interactive in some way, all of them. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I never thought that like, you know, this and this is different from VR. I never thought that like my body would be connected to the game that I'm playing. And it, it, it just, it feels different from VR in that way to me. Yeah. VR, you're putting on a headset, you know, you're, it's, it's, you know, it you know, you're doing different. stuff, right? You yeah. can't like, even <laughs> as, as immersive as VR is. And, and I played a couple of VR games that I loved. I mean, just loved, but, but again, like, you're physically wearing a helmet. <laughs> I right. mean, you can't. Yeah. The, no, no, no amount of immersion is going to take you away from the fact that you're, you know, the dog's going to bark, but it's going to be not in your game. It's going to be behind you on the couch. You know what I mean? Like it's, mm-hmm. it doesn't have that. Um, and where where this is just a, it's kind of its own unique style of immersion. Um, yeah. that it that it manages to convey quickly too. So, um, but yeah, you're right. That the the VR comparison, it's true, right? Because that's. That's supposed to be the, you know, that full immersion, you know. You put mm-hmm. on, but you're putting on this, this whole thing, and then all of a sudden you're like, "I'm a wizard!" Like, ah, you know, yeah. you know, you're not a wizard. You're wearing the helmet, but I could absolutely believe that I was this person on this yeah. boat ride. Mm-hmm. So it just got me thinking about, like, you know, and I'm I'm not the kind of person who's going to come up with the next, you know, surprise and interactive, mm. you know, gameplay. But I was surprised by this. I just this is something that I never conceived of i never thought would be yeah. possible um and it's it's just very very cool yeah for sure yeah i feel yeah i feel i feel almost identical this is gonna be this is gonna be one of those uh episodes i think uh <laughs> dave where, where we get to the end of this and we're both just like like you, you or i say something the other person says i know right because yeah. it's just like it's <laughs> you know it just um it has that it has that feel to it, and it's funny you mentioned Jacob's video at the beginning, um, because I watched the video as well. I'm a, I'm a I'm a Patreon subscriber to him. I'm a big fan of pretty much everything Jacob puts out. His video essays are like I listen to him and the way he talks about video games. Like oh my my dumb brain could have never came up with that, and it's so mm-hmm. true. Um, <laughs> and uh, and yeah, it's so like this is this is one of those games where like after watching his video, like I felt like I was thinking about this from the same perspective. He was it, like, it just, it feels like if you, if you are into this game and you get it, you really get it. And it's, mm-hmm. um, it's really cool. It feels like you're part of something. You know what I mean? Like, um, the people who I've played, who have played this game, who I've talked to about it, which are not that many, unfortunately, um, all kind of have that similar, you know, sense about it. It's, it's kind of a shame. You're right. Uh, other than you, I don't think I've ever talked to somebody who played this game before and yeah. it it kind of made the rounds around like you know people like Jacob on YouTube who are talking about their games of the year and like mm-hmm. I think uh like I think it's Polygon that does like their top 50 every year and I think this yeah. was on the list but yeah. yeah I think it was too um this was this was not in all of the you know top 10 games of the year podcasts that I listen to and that I participate in uh yeah. well it was on it was on my list of games i wanted to talk yeah, about too. at the end of yeah, 2021 yeah. but uh, a lot of other shows i didn't really hear about it and it's a shame so i i hope that everyone listening to this i hope that you uh that you trust brian and i and uh go check this out because it, it's it's really special the the one thing mm-hmm. the other thing i want to kind of mention is that this story uh and like so you're kind of inhabiting this character benny and uh so you're kind of going through benny's life but you also have Benny's family in the story. And so I just want to kind of mm-hmm. introduce this. Um, we talked about Gone Home. One of the cool things about Gone Home is that you really get to know the parents and uh, the the sister. You get to know the other. You actually, in Gone Home, it's weird. The character you know the least about is your player Yourself. character. In yeah, you just game. know that you're coming home. That's all right. you know. Yeah, <laughs> really. I mean, it's pretty much it. Yeah, in this game, uh, you get that same kind of thing where, like, well, you understand Benny a little bit more, but you you learn a lot about your mom and dad in the game as you're going mm-hmm. through, and it it's cool because you you get these scenes, and uh, I don't know, these scenes are what two minutes long each. They're they're pretty yeah. short, and yeah. they're almost like it's like they're like these flashback vignettes of your yeah. life, you know, that you're that you're essentially rewatching from from the perspective of being carried across the river sticks and you're going back and you know, this is your life type of stuff, you know, um, that's really reducing it, <laughs> but that's essentially what it is. Yeah. We, so you start out when you're a baby and you kind of move forward through Benny's life. And throughout these moments, you get these short conversations uh, between mom and dad or mom talking to you or dad talking to you, or you overhear them talking in the next room and stuff like that. And so you get this, I don't know, you get this really nice just kind of family dynamic. The voice acting for both mom and dad is really good. I especially mm-hmm. like 
The dad has a kind of voice that I don't feel like I hear in games very often. I can't yeah, quite describe sure. it. It's just a unique voice. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's just a good uh, good family setup. Yeah, it feels very natural. Um, and I think that's that's one of the one of the cooler things about it is that. Um, and I, I have no problem with prestige voice acting and things like that, but like, yeah. none of these people feel like they're playing a character. They're just kind of being who they are, which is mm-hmm. a unique skill set in and of itself. And um, and you just don't you don't see a lot of it ever. You know, normally when you're playing through these games, there's like very defined characters, and these characters are well defined. But you're getting snippets to their regular life. You're not seeing them on these grand stages, you're just seeing them like, you know, after dinner or like on a car right. ride, like where they're at their most normal, like all of us at our most normal, we're just kind of chilling at home or whatever. And yeah. um, to make that compelling and, and believable is, is a, an achievement at all, you know, uh, all by itself. So um, yeah, I really, I really kind of became very invested in the relationship that the mom and dad had. And then kind of like with things that happened with the mom later on in the story. And it's, um, it's a, it's a it, you become very attached to these characters at least I did uh pretty pretty quickly. Yeah, that's a good point you made. We talked about how we kind of felt like this game was happening to us, like we mm-hmm. we felt like we were the character and that's a lot easier to do when you're hanging out with your family after dinner or like, you know, the one of the biggest events in the first part of the game is your family gets a cat and like mm-hmm. You know, many of us have had situations where we get a pet. This is something that's really relatable to everybody. And you're right. It's not like Edith Finch, you're walking around this weird cursed house that has happened to, mm-hmm. you know, right. that's not something that I have experience with, but I've had experience sitting around at the dinner table. My parents are having a boring conversation. You know, they don't yeah. they don't make an effort to make this this like, you know, not every conversation is this deep thought provoking thing yeah. or uh, you know, like you said, you're not on a grand adventure. You're literally, you're just a kid, a normal kid, you know, playing mm. the piano. Yep. <laughs> Learn it. Yeah, exactly. Doing, doing normal kid stuff, having normal kid problems, feeling normal kid stress and like having that, um, you know, interaction with your parents and, uh, it's, it, it all feels so normal without feeling generic. Like, it's just like, it, it's just well done. Subtle. It's very subtle. And, yeah. and it, it its subtlety makes it even more effective, at least for me. Yeah, definitely. I think it's really hard to make something that is simple but not boring. You know, mm-hmm. subtle is yeah. a good a good way to say it's a really tough uh, tough balance to strike, and I think they did a good job. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So uh, we're gonna take a little music break, and then uh, you're gonna listen to some of the music. We're gonna come back and kind of round out the non-spoiler section. Just a little chat about what the game looks like and what it sounds like. So you just heard a little bit of music from Before Your Eyes. And uh, Brian, I'm curious, like, um, uh, one of the kind of things that I think about with music is, like, I'm kind of separating soundtracks into, like, uh, Death's Door is an episode, like, as we're recording, it's the most recent episode Mm -hmm. um, to be released of uh, this. It'll be uh, in the the past when this uh, comes out. But um, Death's Door is a soundtrack that, like, I listen to a lot outside of the game because it's yeah for sure it's big it's memorable it has these like crazy electric guitar riffs and stuff like that i really like it (laughs) i don't feel like before your eyes is that kind of soundtrack um Mm -hmm. it's uh well what do you think first before i give my opinion no i um i'm i'm sure if if the history so far of the show (laughs) uh goes we're probably gonna agree on that um yeah no i um before you i listen to a lot of video game soundtracks um i know my family with it just because they'll want to listen to you know um what my four-year-old son calls actual music because he's four (laughs) um and uh and uh but uh i listen to a lot of video game soundtrack and before your eyes never comes up on like a rotation but Mm -hmm. it's just because uh and not to just repeat everything I just said about the story. It's just, um, it's, it's more contextual. It's more subtle. And, um, 
the, they have this, so you mentioned before that Benny's a piano player and they have these piano pieces and these themes that kind of, and motifs that kind of repeat themselves and they only become more meaningful the more you play the game, but it's also not something that I would just like put on in the background. Maybe like if I went to sleep, but maybe I'd try that sometime. Like if I went to sleep, listen to the Before Your Eyes soundtrack, but it does, like you said, like comparing to like a Death's Door, which has these grand kind of like, you know, melodies with these hooks and everything else. And, and and this is just way more kind of, I it's insulting to call it, not insulting, it's maybe a little um, uh, reductive to call it background music, because I think mm-hmm. it's more than that. But that it has that feel to it. Uh, it does. Sure. And because because you're so connected, like, I think this works, and I think you're right. It, it is kind of background music. It is kind of like just emotion in the form of music or tone in the form of music because you're so connected to like what's going on in the scene you don't really you like i mean you are so immersed with uh the blinks and everything like that Mm. i i felt like i i don't know i'm thinking back and i'm like i don't know if i would have had the brain space to appreciate this you know these grand melodies playing in the background and what the music in uh before your eyes does is it just kind Mm. of sets the mood of the scene and it changes to fit what's going on in the scene. Like you said, you have those um, kind of recurring motifs as you go on through the story that kind of uh, bring back the emotion and the memory from earlier in the story a little bit. Yeah. It's um, yeah. Like a lot of times if a, if a game doesn't have music that I listen to outside of the game, then I maybe sometimes I forget to mention it in the episode or something like Mm -hmm. that. But in this, it just, you know, it, it fits so well it's it's not the music is not the focus the way it might be in a different game it, yeah. it's just kind of setting emotion and stuff like that and i think it does it really well yeah it's it's um like uh i'm trying to think of a smart jacob gallery word for this um <laughs> but it's like very experiential like you know like it's tied to the experience um uh that like in the game it feels very appropriate it feels appropriately placed and and they hit some uh real thematic tones especially with those those piano pieces and we'll talk about that in a little bit i'm sure and uh but but yeah it it does it just it's very supplemental there's the word i'm looking for it adds to the experience but it's mm-hmm. not it's not its own thing like when you when you go into and since you talked about death door and i literally listened to that episode last night um the the death door episode which was very good by the way um but Thank i you. uh uh, that that soundtrack has has like bombast, you know what I mean? Like you go into a new area, you go to the like the the lair of the frog king, and it's just this uh this those swampy tones and like like you said, it just it has very memorable things. And it's not to say that the, this soundtrack isn't memorable. It's just not that, you know. It's not it's not meant to be theme music for a new area. This is just kind of like the soundtrack of somebody's life without being a mixtape, you know, it's just kind of, it's just kind of there. And, and it works. Like you said, I think it works very well. It's just maybe not, you know, it serves its purpose, I think. Right. So like, I, I just, you know, on the show, a lot of times when I think like, I want to devote podcast time to talking about a soundtrack, it's because it has these incredible songs that I'm going to remember, you know, like I'm going to remember the song from fighting Ludwig in Bloodborne. And I want to talk about (laughs) that in the episode, but like this, this is kind of the opposite side of like, you know, I don't know, maybe not the opposite, but this is a different side of like soundtrack and like sound design in a game. And I I think this is really good too. So I wanted to just touch on that for a second. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. The sound design is also pretty cool as you're kind of, you know, you, you're going you're not just blinking you're mousing over and interacting with things sometimes uh we talked about playing piano so there's like a little piano playing mini game and stuff like that everything else sounds good the voice acting is good um it's uh yeah just a just good sound design in general i think it has nice nice just kind of atmospheric music and and sound for where you're at um it does have spatial sound because, like, depending on where you're looking on screen, you you will get a little bit of hints of you know sounds from the area that you're in. Um, I think the sound actually, the sound design is really great on the boat. It kind of has that kind of creaky kind of you know like swaying back and forth in the water type of type of feel to it. Um, you know, the the only thing that's missing is like a buoy dinging in the background. You know what I mean? It feels mm-hmm. like <laughs> it very very you know represents where you are and and sells that in in a in a good way. Um. I do think uh, towards the end, um, again, before the spoiler tag, the sound design 
is very effective in certain scenes. Yes. And um and and I think we'll probably talk about that or at least you know it'll be part of the discussions we have post the spoiler wall. We will. Yeah. And the last thing to kind of uh touch on is that this game has um I don't know how I don't know how to exactly describe the visual style. It's it's pretty minimalist, low poly, mm-hmm. but like th- this is this doesn't look like, you know, final fantasy seven or something like that this this is um it's 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 a bit more detailed than that but there there's a definite like art direction that they're going with if if anyone Mm -hmm. just like look up a screenshot of before your eyes you'll see what i'm talking about and uh, we talked before like when you open up a scene there will be a couple of like eye icons on the screen you mouse over you blink it fills in kind of part of the room Mm -hmm. or the scene that you're in um so you 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 get kind of a, a picture of the place that you're in and uh yeah it's like i said it's not too um graphically intense because my computer was able to run it uh but (laughs) that's uh it's good it it fits this i'm not sure that this game would have been served by having you know incredibly detailed textures and stuff like that yeah i it became one of those things um and this is not to dismiss it it just it just very much was what it was and as you started getting through it you realized that like you not not only were would it not serve the story better but it, the graphics clearly weren't why you were there right. um and uh and and yeah it does have a but it does have a um a unique and consistent art style because the mm-hmm. art style for this the, the you know the the boat like you have this talking dog man with you it's obviously that's clearly different than suburbia but right. they managed to still exist in kind of the same art universe you know you can see the connection between the two so i thought that was pretty interesting um and and just that consistency throughout so that when you are going back and forth from flashback to the boat and flashback to the boat it's not like this jarring thing where like oh i'm in you know the suburbs and oh i'm in hell you know what i mean it's not <laughs> it's not a, it's a very smooth transition from one to the other um but and i think the art style definitely um lends itself to that for sure yeah i mean all games want to be able to say this but everything in this game you know the sound the visuals the blinking mechanic it all serves this experience that you're intended yeah. to have you're not uh, you're not supposed to come out of this and say like holy shit before your eyes was like it looks like i'll never forget you know how realistic this looks or something like that's yeah. not what they yeah. want you to take out of this yeah. game um yeah so but it it is good i i don't want to i like i kind of feel like I don't have the words to describe it, but it is good. It does serve the experience that you're having. Yeah, for sure. No, I, I couldn't agree more. That it's it's all part of that same packaging. And, and, and each part kind of feeds another part, too. So it uh, works, all works very well together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's, uh, I guess, get into kind of final thoughts before the spoiler section. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you want people listening to know about Before Your Eyes and what, I mean... I usually ask, do you recommend it? But I think that's abundantly clear at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's uh so this is a very, very loaded term, but I think, I think this game is, I think when, when talking about games from this era of time that we are currently living in, this will be one of those games that is looked back on as being, I, I, I don't want to say important to make myself sound grandiose, but it's a, but I think it's important. It's more important to me personally, at least, than a lot of other games I've played in the last three, four years. Um, that's not to say that it is, you know, it has it had a more significant impact on me. So personally, um, it, it's 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 more important, and I think that it just goes to show that r- really cool feeling, and especially for those of us that play a shit ton of video games, that like. Holy cow, like this is you can still be some surpri- surprised, completely surprised by a game. And even if you come out of this game and be like, ah, you know, that was OK or that wasn't for me. Like, I think it's like cool to experience. So I think if you went into this game and you didn't come out feeling the way I feel, I think just for the time investment, plus the money involved to get in the door, I think it's worth checking out like pretty much across the board. I, I I can't imagine anybody playing this game, even if it wasn't their thing coming out of it and be like, well, that was a waste of time and money. Like I just, Mm -hmm. I feel like it's, it's, it's got significance to it. So if you like video games as a whole, I'd want to just see this thing and get my hands on it just so I, you know, knew what it was. Yeah. That's, that's something that kind of drives me to check out different kinds of games. Like I'm not, and like, there are certain genres of games that I will just 
reject outright and not play Mm -hmm. and like if that's unfair of me cool that's that's the way i am (laughs) i play a lot of games um i try to play i don't know what i'm trying to say is when a game comes out and it has this reputation of being like this is something that is totally unlike any other game that you've ever played and they do it well then i do want to try that and i think that before your eyes uh, definitely deserves that that reputation in 2021 I had a lot of free time. I played over, I can't remember the number. It was over 70 games that I played. Oh, wow, cool. And Before Your Eyes was one of the games that I will remember like for a long time. Like If you ask me in 15 years, I'm not going to remember big details about Metroid Dread, but I will remember <laughs> right. big yeah. details about yeah. Before Your Eyes because it's a mm. just a super unique experience. And like I said before, this is a game that I will recommend uh, to everybody. My favorite games ever are usually not games that I would recommend to everybody. I know there's not going to be people, there are people that will not enjoy playing Bloodborne as much as I Mm -hmm. do. But um, Before Your Eyes is something that I think anyone can enjoy. My dad, who's, to the best of my knowledge, never played a video game, I think he could play this and enjoy it. And that's that's a really special thing that I don't think many games can claim. Yeah, I 100%. Yeah, well said. Yeah. So... Little housekeeping before we uh, go into spoiler town. Uh, Brian, first off, where can people find you and where can they find uh, Kane and Rince? So you can find me. I'm at uh, Brian Tendo 64 on Twitter. Um, it was the best I could do that late in the game. I apologize. Um, and uh, and I have a blog on there. It's BrianBabblesOn.com. I literally just started. I've written like five things. So and uh, I, I am not consistent. So uh, mostly on Twitter, I just post dumb stuff about things i like and then kane and rinse um is at kane and rinse on twitter and we also have a kane and rinse patreon uh, where you can get episodes early and get access to things like um we have monthly patreon exclusive podcasts things like that which i'm very little involved with the producing of but i am hap- happily still subscribed to the patreon to enjoy um so and and if you i i, I I don't want to overset my bounds here, Dave's, but if 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 I I would think that if you like this podcast, you'll probably enjoy Kane and Rince. I know that I enjoyed Kane and Rince before I was a part of it, and I certainly enjoy this podcast too. And if you just like people talking about video games and trying to talk about them in a way that, like, there's no there's no conversation I've ever had and I've ever heard on this podcast on Kane and Rince or this one that I've left feeling like I didn't learn something from like about the game about the people who played it about the way they feel and that's just kind of the way I feel about both these shows so yeah if you like this one you'll probably like that one um and if you don't that that's cool too <laughs> like what you like <laughs> well if you don't like this show I don't I'm not sure why you're still listening an hour into yeah. the recording but um, um yeah uh definitely recommend people check out Kane and Rince uh consider contributing to the patreon uh cane and rinse is one of two things that i'm a patron of on patreon uh, I oh think wow it's, thanks it's very awesome. very uh deserving of that but uh yeah like i said they've been going for 10 years they have covered i think over 500 games at this point yeah well yeah this will be uh well i think we're on episode or issue sorry leon Ugh. um <laughs> we are on issue i think we just recorded the kingdom hearts issue uh two days ago and i think it was 506 so yeah. yeah they're 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 well on their way again i've only been a part of it for the last two years so i can't claim credit for most of it but right but if they're um what i'm trying to say is that if you like a video game chances are canon rinse has talked about it at some point so you can go back and <laughs> yeah. find it and i i definitely highly recommend it i will put links to all things brian and canon rinse down in the oh, episode wow, thank uh, you the show notes down there <laughs> so people can find it easily and uh, for anyone that's going to tap out now because you don't want to be spoiled on Before Your Eyes, and I do recommend that. I do recommend you stop listening now and for go sure. play the game. It takes two hours. Um, come back later. Brian and I will be here waiting. Uh, but yes. if that's you, if you want to tap out, thank you for listening this far. If you want to support Tales from the Backlog, the best ways to do that is to subscribe. Uh, leave ratings and reviews. Um you stick it to, we'll just say uh, by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, you're sticking it to Joe Rogan over on Spotify. Uh, yes. So do that. Yeah, big fan of that. <laughs> and if you leave a five-star rating on Spotify, you're sticking it to uh, whoever is doing bad things at Apple. I'm sure somebody is. So <laughs> There's got to be that. somebody. <laughs> <laughs> please leave uh, ratings and reviews. That's very helpful. Also, um, I'm very active on Twitter and Instagram. 
That's at Tales from the Backlog on Instagram and at TFTBL Pod on Twitter. Those links are in the episode description as well. I also do a podcast called A Top Three Podcast, where each episode, episode, not issue, Brian, uh, Leon. <laughs> Uh, each episode my uh, buddies from high school and i pick a topic we do our top threes in that topic sometimes we talk video games most of the time we just talk about food though that's where we're really in our element so check out a top three podcast if that's interesting to you that's a good time we are going to take a break when we come back it is full spoiler time for before your eyes I want to begin the spoiler section for uh, Before Your Eyes with that content warning that I talked about earlier. Uh, If this is something that um, is going to be uh, distressful or triggering for you, uh, I at least think you should proceed with extreme caution throughout the spoiler section and uh, playing the actual game. Uh, But Before Your Eyes deals heavily with the idea of a a sick and dying uh, child. And if that is something that... um, For any reason, if that's something that's going to cause you distress, uh, please stop listening or uh, avoid playing this game because it is, uh, I don't, it doesn't get like graphic at the end, but it's very powerful and very explicit how much, uh, how much pain and suffering is going on uh, throughout the end. So please, please, please uh, heed the content warning. On we go. So uh, Brian, I think this story is a kind of story of two halves. uh, I think Mm -hmm. like, so we have the, uh, the beginning half and then we have the uh the truth we'll say Mm, so yeah um did you like when you're playing through the first half all the way up through like when benny becomes a you know successful uh, artist and stuff like that did you have any inclination that something was off so i i don't think so um I'd like to think that maybe my foreshadowing eyes were uh, tainted by the blink mechanic because I what, like didn't see it coming. But <laughs> what I did think, though, is that when we were going through, um, like, like obviously the piano recital didn't work out, um, and, and Benny kind of and his mother had a falling out, and then, you know, Benny rediscovers art through his failure, and then it becomes this, you know, thing. He, now he's becoming this worldwide known artist. I was like... I remember thinking, wow, this is cool, but it was like one of the first things that I just didn't think was believable, which I think was, in hindsight, interesting because it wasn't believable because it wasn't true. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just, but even during those times, like when Benny was, um, you know, uh, having success, but still not, not uh, being like fulfilled, like being happy it with that success i was thinking like okay maybe this is going to go somewhere maybe it's going to and then and then when the wall was kind of fully lifted when you have that scene when you come back to the boat and the boat the boat the ferryman the fairy dog or whatever you want to call him mm-hmm. uh kind of starts yelling at you a little bit like are you kidding like this, this is not this isn't going to work for the gatekeeper you know what i mean like you need to find your truth you need to do this and like like that was kind of the part like i'm like oh wow and then it's just kind of the domino started to fall and then once you kind of knew, I was like, oh, Jesus, this is how this is going to go. And even knowing it from that point, on, I want to say that's maybe half an hour out from the end, somewhere in that range. Right. Um, That was still kind of, it was still kind of a gut punch, you know, like, um, but no, I don't think that I, I, I definitely didn't have the mystery solved, you know, in quotes. Uh, I, I, I was pretty all in on the, well, this is the story they're telling and I've loved it so far. So let's keep going. And then it hit. And I was like, uh, then the story became a way more effective and B way, way more, uh, like just hard, just a hard hitting story. Yeah. So like, I didn't expect anything was off because I thought that I was going to play through a person's entire life from childhood to like being really old, you know? Right. So like, 
we were, and I knew that this wasn't a really long game and I was, you know, um, I was like, okay, I've been playing for a while, you know, Benny's in his thirties or something like that. And he's a successful artist. Like, okay, where is this going to go now? And I think the part where, um, the part where his mom dies happens before you find out that it's a lie. I think that happens in his imagination. I'm almost positive. Yeah. That's why he becomes famous. He starts painting Mm -hmm. inspired by his mom and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, this is going to go through just a, a regular life with the regular, you know, at some point your parents die and stuff like that. Like you're going to hit these moments uh, throughout his life. Maybe Benny's going to get married. Uh, he, you know, in that fake life, he meets up with his friend, uh, Chloe. Yep. Right. Um, yep. So maybe they're going to date, they're going to have a kid, they're going to grow old and we're going to live a life like this. So I, I, I was kind of blindsided when um, it cut back to the boat, the ferryman's acting kind of weird. All those gulls start screaming at yeah. him. You remember? Yeah. And I was like, yep oh, uh, that's not a good sign. Like, you no, know. yeah, no, it comes, it gets like real, um, I don't want to say supernatural is the wrong word, but it gets real, like serious on the boat, like for mm-hmm. a moment in a way that it kind of hadn't been like, uh, like the boatman had always kind of been, you know, a lot was riding on him getting you through the gatekeeper, right? Like he, he wants you to get through and he wants you to tell your best story and tell the best things. And, and so, in a sense, it makes sense that this spirit of this kid, as it turns out, is trying to make up this story to serve this character. You know, like, oh, yeah, I, I would I was going to be a piano player and then this happened and this. And it's almost like that lie that spins out of control, you know, and that and that it gets bigger and more grandiose and more grandiose to the point where obviously it's false. It's just mm-hmm. I didn't get to that point personally because I was just kind of along with her. I And not to go back to feeling like I was the character, but like. Like I was telling the story, right? So of course it's right. got to be true, you know. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm, I'm telling them what happened, and uh, and then when it gets turned on its head, it was like, oh, like, and it, it, yeah, it was, it was, it was a lot to kind of take in in a very short amount of time, too. Like it hit the brakes just real hard on it, and I think that was really a tremendously effective um, for making me feel terrible, <laughs> but not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. It's hard to explain. <laughs> like you know, like it's, you know, that's uh, not to be. Uh, so fucking artsy fartsy about it but like you know like you just like like that's what that's what good pieces of art and pieces of fiction do right they make you feel something they kind of catch you off guard and they and they make you react in a way maybe you weren't expecting and that's what that moment did for me too and then from that point on like it was like like i was on the verge of like oh maybe i'll finish this tomorrow or maybe go to bed and then that happened i'm like i'm not i don't care i don't care if this goes on for another hour and a half i'm Mm -hmm. i'm 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 here you know i'm not going anywhere till i know what's going on yeah the, i get so like number one um i am almost never clued in on foreshadowing or uh you know <laughs> possible unreliable narrators or anything like that i'm right. very like in the moment when i watch movies when i play games uh, if there is a twist i will 99 percent of the time be blindsided by it i'm just right. i'm just never looking ahead um, i'm always just kind of going along with what's happening uh, the only thing in this game that kind of gave me that, like, you know, hey, that was weird, and they never kind of expanded on it, was those kind of interstitial scenes uh, with the ringing phone uh, yep. or the one where you're walking to the door when it's all dark outside and stuff yep. like that. Um, I think those are impossible to kind of reach the end uh, in yes. the first yeah. half of the game. They set the time. You'd have to hold your eyes open, and I, I assume the game would move you on before you yeah. get to the phone, you know? I actually had one of those situations happen during my replay. I was trying so hard to keep my eyes open and kind of forcing my eyes to be open. And eventually the the ferryman just kind of like slapped you, like makes you come <laughs> to. It's like, hey, what's no, what's going on? To keep, let's move this along. Like it was not in a way that was like uh, jarring in the appropriate way, should I say. It was not, didn't feel forced, didn't feel, but it felt very much like the game was like, hey, yeah, we know. Did you walk away from the screen? Like what, <laughs> what's going yeah. on? Like, yeah, that type of thing, so. Yeah, those those were the only scenes where, like, kind of in the back of my head, I was like, "Oh, that's interesting." I never got an answer for what happened in those scenes because I I kind of mm-hmm. felt like this is important. It has a little bit more gravity than the the yeah. average scene, and then you yeah. never got an answer for it in the first half. So that was the only thing. But I wasn't thinking about that at the time. I was very much like, "Oh, cool, good for Benny. He's a successful artist, and he just yeah. met his yeah. childhood best friend." possible girlfriend depending yeah, on possible what you romantic say. interest there yep exactly yeah. 
it's interesting in the first half, I guess, before we move on, uh, interesting, there are a couple of like kind of fake choices. That sounds mm-hmm. mean. Um, I never got the feeling that this would be a kind of branching paths type narrative. No. But yeah. Yeah. You do get some choice in there. So, uh, you, there's one where you, uh, get to choose whether to sneak out of the house and go hang out with Chloe mm-hmm. uh, on the beach. Um, and it kind of, kind of presents you that um that kind of choice because this is the night before benny's audition it gives you that right. uh, like you know do you want to go hang out with your friend and you know not get enough sleep or do you want to blow off your friend and uh you know have a good audition you still yeah, fail you admission wanna... either way i'm not sure if either you tried way, it both yeah. ways yeah i did the second time around i tried to uh, practice or stay home get some sleep yeah, or whatever i felt and, bad and i felt bad out. blowing chloe off like me that. too because the first <laughs> time i was like yeah if, no fuck this audition i'm going to hang out with <laughs> what are we gonna do go look at the stars with this uh yeah no i um i absolutely did that i also did that because that's totally what i would have done <laughs> yeah <laughs> at that age sure. like i would have you no know, i wouldn't have. there's no way um so yeah, no, it, it, but it, it, you still blow the audition either way, like you said. It doesn't. Um, so that fake choice, like you said, but it it does. It does kind of push you, I think, a little bit towards going to hang out with Chloe, and then so you, when you blow the audition, it feels very natural. Yeah. I think I would have been not pissed, but I think it would have been at least a little bit like. Like if I stayed home and then still sucked at the audition, I would have been like, well, what the hell? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I, um, I, I didn't, uh, it, it didn't work out for me, but, but um, you still, yeah, that you was still, uh, you crushed the audition and that was kind of cool, but then you still yeah. fail admission. And I was like, yeah. oh, okay. So I definitely should have gone and hung out with Chloe. Good to show how, exactly. So, and the thing that I, um, and this is a really, it, it becomes a recurring theme towards the end. Um, well, it's a recurring theme for the whole game because it's not that long, but like just that you can feel that, um, vicarious living your mother's doing through you yeah yeah that it that was so effective to me and i don't even i don't even consider myself having parents that did that to me but i was feeling that pressure like i don't want to do this i want to be drawing i want to be hanging out i want to be and you just felt like like mom was always the one that was kind of like nope we got to get to practice and dad was kind of being like well why don't we let them decide like it was like but it was just parents kind of being parents and that was so effective to me because I could feel that pressure because a I didn't want to do it, which is very relatable when your parents tell you to do something. But also b I didn't want to disappoint them, which is also the way I felt. Like so, it had that. It just it just it just landed that feeling, and um, and that was that was, and then before knowing how it ends, even like you know I'm just like I can, well I can't I can't screw this up, you know what I mean? But I also I, I made the decision to kind of willfully screw it up, but. Like you said, it it wouldn't have necessarily mattered either way because you were still going down the same path. So like, and there's another choice where uh, it's either after the audition or before it where you, you're looking at some sheet music and you have a choice to crumple it up and throw it out the window yeah. or kind of save it. And, you know, mom says, okay, keep practicing, try again next year. And you can yep. you throw it out the window and stuff like that. And again, those choices don't mean anything, but uh, this is... This is something I, I like about Firewatch, even though your choices don't matter in that game either. Um, mm-hmm. it, it just helps you get connected to Benny, and you're kind of playing your version sure. of Benny. You're yeah. going to rebel against your mom who's trying to control your life, or yep. are you going to just kind of put up with it um, and you know be a good boy, practice the piano again? <laughs> right. And I don't have a problem with that fake choice. In, unless it's in a game where it's like your choices matter, you know, you could end up this game as the bad guy or the good. Like, there's a lot of games that like very much focus on like this game's all about choices and how you choose to play is the way the game works out. And this game is never that. So, mm-hmm. it even though like you said, like you said, it sounds mean to say fake choices, but in reality, like they're they're telling their story and you're just kind of along for the ride. And that sounds dismissive too because it is very interactive. But but really, you're you're going to see through the story one way or the other. So um, it kind of, it's almost, it's almost kind of comes with the territory a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That I had also written down that um, kind of parental pressure that like um, mom, mom kind of failed or had given up on her dream of uh, being a professional musician. Mm -hmm. And she is like, once Benny shows an ounce of talent at playing the piano, she's like, okay, let's do this. You are going yep. to be the best piano player possible. And yep. 
yeah, like uh, my parents were never like that, but I, I certainly like understand the, um, I understand that that is a very common thing that would happen. And uh, I don't have any kids, but it, it, I, I feel like it might be an easy thing to fall into as a parent. It, you know, yeah. if your kid shows yeah. talent in something that you were not able to pursue in your life. Yeah, for sure. Like even even I have I have children, but they're very young, and so which means they're still very dumb. So um, <laughs> they are <laughs> no. But the reality is like you know my my son shows an aptitude to something. We like and even if even just an interest wise, like so you know like my four year old got into the Ghostbusters, so now he has a Ghostbusters fucking everything. You know what yeah, I mean? Like exactly. hey, Ghostbusters birthday party. Go. You just you want to. You want to make the kid happy, but I also want to like, you know, if he shows an interest, like, hey, well, you know, you, here, here yeah. it is. Um, so I could definitely see falling into that trap um, or, or not, not even trap, just like that would feel like the natural progression of things. Right. And then that yeah. kid gets to a point that we all got to some earlier than others where you're just kind of like, oh, I don't actually want to do this. Mm-hmm. And then being able to separate yourself from that has to be very difficult. Yeah. I mean, like. I'm just kind of imagining like I, when I was a kid, I wanted to be, I wanted to be Michael Jordan. So like, of course, just, I mean, God help if, if I ever have a kid, God help them if they show any talent in basketball, because (laughs) I would, I would just be like, okay, this is our ticket to the big time. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's go. It's a, it's an, it's an interest. It's gotta be a hard thing to kind of balance uh, or hard thing to kind of internalize that just because your kid is good at something doesn't mean they actually like it. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah that's gotta be wild. Um, so it's, it's really, it's handled really well in this story. They, they do a yeah. great job. And it, and you can see the pressure it creates between mom and dad too. Like dad is like, kind of like, and I think, I think we, especially in modern pop culture, we fall into a trap of like, dad is the cool dad. And like, mom mm-hmm. is kind of like, Oh, the overbearing, <laughs> the overbearing mom type. And this doesn't feel that way at all. It feels very, um, very much of less of a mom's being mom and dad's being dad. And more of like mom had a dream that didn't work out. Right. And dad is just kind of along for the ride with a lot of that. And, and was, you know, the the family comes first and everything. And not that it doesn't come first to mom, but as soon as mom gets that hook through Benny, like you, you see her, she really grasped onto that. And that felt very real, like something yeah. that could easily happen as opposed to just being like, well, mom's nagging me, dad. And dad's like, let's go smoke cigarettes in the garage. Like, it's yeah. not that <laughs> at all. You know, like it's, it's, it's a real, it's, it feels very much like a real relationship. Um, which only makes it even more heartbreaking later on. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah, it's a uh, yeah, it's it's interesting how they built to that point because I thought for sure that was going to kind of be the apex of the story and like maybe we, were we going to do a runaway story or a th- like and like you know because clearly that conflict was coming to a head and yeah. then it, then it went a place that I was not expecting. Um, yeah, for sure. So you get that scene um, in the first half before you find out it's all a lie. You get the well, not all a lie, but uh, you get that yeah. scene where Benny gets sick and he has to spend uh, spend time inside. And um, I don't know. I obviously I didn't read into this at all. I had a like when I was a kid, I had mono, so I missed school for mm-hmm. uh, an extended time. Uh, yep. And this just kind of was like, oh yeah, you know, this happens sometimes. This yeah, happens. Every- yeah, every kid goes through that. Yeah, I I remember I got I got chicken pox. It was like the I was in like the fourth grade. It was like the first day of summer vacation. I got chicken pox. It was like the oh, next two weeks. Shit. You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> motherfucker. I'm sure I didn't say that. Then well, I don't know. I was I'm pretty foul mouth <laughs> as it is. But like, um, but yeah, no, it's just one of those things. Like 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 oh, I'd rather be doing anything else than this, but yeah. I have to stay in here and I have to be away. Like yeah, that that's a very normal kid feeling. That kind of opening to the princess bride where the kids just laying in bed and grandpa comes over to read a story you know Mm -hmm. like it's that's i think very relatable um yeah so yeah i didn't i didn't i didn't see that going down that branching path either either it just seemed like a yeah the the kids get sick it's what they do yeah but it just it just turns out that that's the point where the lie kind of starts yeah uh, where yeah like in the the first version of the story benny rediscovers his love of drawing and gets better becomes a famous artist we've talked about that um just uh before we get into like that thing at the end um that part where benny's uh where benny's mom dies and you see the effect on his dad was uh another was one of the first like very affecting things for me uh before like the last half hour of the game is just one ball of emotion but 
Yeah, um, for sure. This was one of the first parts where I was like, oh man, they are like, they're, they're executing this really, really well. Uh, because his, yeah. his, his dad up until that point had been such a, a carefree kind of easygoing mm-hmm. guy, go with the flow. Yeah. Everything's going to be all right, buddy. You know? And then this, this hits and he, he has a couple lines where he says like, man, this, I am having such a hard time with this, like stuff yeah. like that. It, it, that was one of the first kind of big affecting moments. Yeah. But like, uh, uh, I've been, this, this, this is going somewhere relatable, I promise. But I've, I've been, I've been reading you. You've been playing the Yakuza games, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So like, so like, how is grief represented in the Yakuza games? Like, no, yeah, screaming at the sky, and then Kiryu and then you beats go beat the, the shit, shit out, out of everybody. Somebody. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> so like, so like, relatable grief in video games is not something that is um that that's done often, and when it's done often, it's not even necessarily done what I would consider particularly well. There's certain really uh great aspects or really believable aspects of it but they normally turn into other things in video games right like a revenge tale or like a Mm -hmm. uh or like or like a a quest for meaning or even even like in a game that i think pulls off grief really well which is brothers a tale of two sons like yeah even that game like you're wandering through a mystical landscape so just to see kind of grief laid bare and just like looking at your dad being like man i don't know if i can do this like that was like it was just like oh my god like it was so it, to anybody who's ever experienced grief, which we all most likely have, like it, that, that's that's real. Like that felt yeah. real. And having that, and again, not bringing it just back to the mechanics of the game, but having like being the kid watching your dad go through, you kind of flipped it on itself in a way you, that you don't normally see. That was, it was something. It really, it, like you said, that was the first, not the first time, but that was one of the, one of the first major times you're like, whoa, this is, like, this is heavy in the right way. I think. Yeah. Um, and that a lot and a lot of games fumble that because it's really hard to do. Is I'm not criticizing them. It's just not. It's much easier to go the Yakuza route. You're like, oh, my fake mob dad died, so I'm gonna go beat the shit out of everybody in the way. You know what I yeah. mean? Throw a guy off the roof of a building because mm-hmm. because Yakuza. <laughs> you know, it's it's like uh, this. This is the counterpoint to that, and it's just it was so well done. And not to jump too far ahead at once, but like it continues that that process for me of taking these incredibly difficult things and handling them in a way that you just. And, and and while handling them delicately, while also not handling them with kid gloves, and that right. is like, I I don't know how you do that. Um, I'm still kind of amazed at, at the way I feel about that story. None of it, none of it felt cheap. It right. all felt earned in a lot of ways. So, and like this scene we're talking about with uh, his mom dying and the effect on his dad. This is a very short scene. Mm-hmm. It, it's maybe a couple of little things. It's about five minutes in the whole story, but it just yeah. has a couple of like extremely real situations that make it hit harder than, yeah, like you said, any of the the myriad deaths in a Yakuza games and stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I love Yakuza, but... Of course, um, yeah, me too. This is... <laughs> it's a different thing. <laughs> gravity and weight and tragedy is not something that they treat in the same way as Before Your Eyes did. There's a, yeah. a line from his dad, or like there's a situation where like his dad is selling the house because he doesn't want to be in that house anymore. And that mm-hmm. was just a very real like, oh shit, like this is, you know, this is someone maybe someone's personal experience one of my favorite things about playing yeah. indie games is how like you can pretty easily imagine that this is someone's personal experience that they've now For brought sure. to this story yeah yeah so 100 percent. that's the thing like um like without getting too personal like uh um uh, we, a situation with my father when when his mother died my grandmother um about seven years ago um he had the, he had lived in the house that he grew up in and his mom moved in later in life and everything like that. And like, and that was a very real thing for him. They ended up moving out of the house because it was just, it was, it was a lot, it was a lot to deal. And that's such a real thing that like re, mm-hmm. that people go through on a daily basis. And then the emotion and weight of just that decision on its own in itself is, is um, it just, it, again, it rings very true. So yeah, that that part with dad uh, kind of finishes, and it, it's a pretty quick uh, run to this this first kind of like end of the you know the live version of the story when Benny gets famous, he meets his mm. um, he meets Chloe again. Uh, Chloe asks him to hang out. This is kind of like the happy version, um, and 
so I thought this was the end of the game uh, here because it it, I, it it doesn't give you credits, but it does kind of like lead up to this in a way where I thought like, oh, this is a happy ending uh, for this game. Benny went yeah. through normal personal tragedies that we all experience. Now this game is over. That was an interesting experience. Uh, it would have been enough for me, um, I think. And uh, this yeah, is probably the, for me too. Yeah. I think this, so after this part, and this is before the seagull starts screaming at you, uh, you get yeah. to kind of recount the story a little bit. So um, like the, the ferryman's like rehearsing the story for the, the gatekeeper and the, yeah. the ferryman kind of says, you know, like, um, uh, Benny was a kid who like enjoyed piano or uh, was forced to play piano. And you get to pick kind of your version of the story. Um, yeah. My mom was a composer or my mom was an accountant. You know, mm-hmm. you get to do that and kind of, I well, first of all, I like that a lot. It kind of gives you this final, um, you know, b- this is your definitive version of Benny's story or so you think. Yeah. Yeah, you think you think you're building that um, the, that that basically do the doing the Mad Libs for what the for what he's gonna say to the gatekeeper. Right, you're just gonna say he's gonna come up and be like, Benny was a piano player, his mom was a composer, he went through life, he failed his audition, and then blah 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 up and on through the line. And I thought that too. I thought we were like approaching the end. Here we go, and then that goes off the rails. Uh, yeah. Um, well, and- so like you find out the seagulls start shrieking, and you find out that um, the seagulls are former souls who tried to lie about their lives and now mm-hmm. he he calls them like lie goals or lie birds yeah or... like i think it, i think it was oh god i just played it i can't remember lie goals sounds, <laughs> anyway sounds right but i'm not sure that's what they are they're they're yelling because they've picked up that you're lying about this and so like yeah. but just to backtrack a few steps now i kind of realized that like i wanted to make the most grandiose story for the gatekeeper about benny's life and so mm-hmm. when you find out that that's a lie, which it might take a replay to kind of get that. But I was like, oh shit, like they got me too. Now I'm lying about my life. I'm trying to be as impressive as possible for the gatekeeper. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's definitely setting that up. Like you're trying to, so now you're trying not only to satisfy your own life and your own story, but you're trying to satisfy the fo- the, the, the the boatman, you know, because yeah. he's very, obviously has some sort of stake in whether or not you get a, through he wants mm-hmm. he wants a win you know what i mean like uh yeah uh and and you're so yeah like i wanted to tell the the best story like because because clearly i'm thinking me being benny and the player at the same time that only the brightest and best and greatest people are going to get to go to this other side right yeah. so you don't want to tell you don't want to tell just an average tale about a guy who you know was like you know metal around like you know no they, i was this I was this artist. I'm this artisan. I had a vision. You know, you have all yeah. these things you want to like convey, and it becomes very uh, apparent. Very uh, comes apparent very quickly. Excuse me. That um, that's not at all what they're looking for. Which is which makes right. me feel good about my dumb life. You know what I <laughs> yeah, mean? Exactly. Like you know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. Um, but like what they're looking for, <laughs> what the boatman's looking for, and what he kind of encourages you to do um as you as you start to go back is to sort through the lies and tell the story what really happened yeah and he gives you he gives you this like this sense of gravity where mm-hmm. like he he was kind of friendly you know like um yeah i'm gonna talk me through this it's gonna be okay you know but mm-hmm. once he finds out you're lying he's like hey cut the shit like this is yep. serious stuff you it's have one to of those, tell me the yeah. truth yeah it's one of those situations where like if I didn't know anything about the game going in, I would be at that point. I'd be like, "Is this turning into a horror game? Like, is this gonna be like a? <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Like, it has like those. And and then you look back on those scenes you were talking about before, like walking in the dark, like the phone ringing, going to the door. Um, like it has like some of those that would be maybe ominous overtones if it wasn't for the fact that the game was kind of leading you down a different path. But but right. like you said, it has gravity. Yeah, it really does. Like you you start to realize that this is your shot. And if yeah. not, you're going to be flying around the boat, screeching at the next liar that comes along. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, um, <laughs> yeah. And, and and that's yeah. It starts to become very real very quickly. So he he kind of like takes you back through the first kind of I don't know a few years of Benny's life. Those first five scenes or so. You and this is, I thought this was cool. You you start to just like play the game again, 
mm. at the same pace that you do the first time. But he's quickly, he's like, no, no, no. I don't care about this scene on the beach yeah. with your mom. Yeah. I don't care. Move on. Yep. So he, he pushes yep. you forward. And then you get to those scenes um, where the phone is ringing. And this is the first kind of change to the blink mechanic where he says, okay, keep your eyes open as long as you can. And yep. uh, if you blink, he's like, come on, dude. Eyes open. That Keep them this open. This is important. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, we need to know what happened here. You know, you can't forget this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there's there's two of those scenes. There's the one where the phone is ringing and you find out that um, your grandpa had died. Uh, the one that mom was really excited about him visiting um, yeah. to show off uh, Benny's piano playing, I think. Uh, yeah. Maybe like a... Actually, I think both of these. So the other one is uh, you find out that uh, you, your cat had some kittens, and then it looks like coyotes or something have killed the kittens yeah. outside. Both of these are like what I assume is just first experiences with death uh, for Benny. Yeah, 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 and trauma kind of like just suppressed, which like that makes a lot of sense, you know, for especially for that age. You know, you kind of compartmentalize and and put things in boxes to kind of you know make yourself still be able to be a happy kid mm-hmm. without you know kind of this overarching fear of you know the impending doom coming at you or whatever. Yeah, and oh, for me also the the death of a pet I think was the first kind of experience with anything like that close to my life. So mm-hmm, um, for that sure, was something I definitely understood. Uh, so yeah, you get your answers for those, and this just kind of sets you on that path, and you quickly get to that part where Benny um, Benny gets sick, but then uh, I think. Is this one of those scenes where you have to close your eyes and hold them shut? Or I think that comes in later. But you overhear the doctors. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, your eyes are, I think you, you're pretending to sleep, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And you're overhearing the doctors kind of talking about what's going on with you. And you're hearing your mom and dad's reactions to it. Right. Um. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, that's, that's, um. That's kind of the beginning of like the series of gut punches with this game. Not not the mm-hmm. beginning. It's I say to call them gut punches because I'm so positive on the experience. But it's just like like you start to get the sense that something's very wrong in a very real way. And yeah. and in a way and they're and they're treating you like a kid because you are still one. So you're not in on it. You know what I mean? You right. have that control taken away from you in the sense that they're trying to protect you, but you're being protected through being ignorant of your own situation in some ways and um and yeah that's i mean that's anything anybody who's ever had a kid who felt like an adult was feeding them a line of crap you know you, mm-hmm. you know that feeling uh you can slip right back into that feeling like why aren't they telling me this they can't trust me with this information they don't think mm-hmm. i can handle it you know all those feelings and um and yeah no it, that it's and then, and then it starts on and then there's you know um and I'm not trying to to go too far. Please stop me if I am. But then, then that that rolls right into what I thought was just going to be dealing with the illness. And then you start seeing and having to deal with how your mother is unable to deal with your illness. Right. And she suddenly she becomes. So there's this series of scenes where you're in your bed, you know, because you're sick, mm-hmm. and it's going along. And mom is there at first, and then suddenly it's just dad coming in, and just dad checking on you, and just dad, and just dad, and just, and all of a sudden mom is gone, like essentially vacant. And it's because, and as you find out, she and dad tells you this at one point, like she is, she's a wreck, yeah, and she doesn't want to be around you when she's a wreck, so mm-hmm. she's just not really being around you, and that's like, oh my god, it just was that that to me was as heartbreaking as anything else that followed. Yeah. Just because like, you know, and I'm not even talking the just from being a parent and everybody can put themselves in the shoes, but just like not wanting to be around the one you love because you're heartbroken about losing that one that you love is mm-hmm. like the way that hit me. I was not expecting it at all. Uh, like, I mean, I knew it was going to be heavy and stuff, but that 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 affected me. I thought about that. I still think about that. Um, Like, it's just like. It's so real and so beautifully done in a way that I completely understand, not necessarily justify, but I can understand that reaction. Um, yeah, that that whole segment, that whole series, basically from then to the end, I could I will talk, I could talk about hour, uh, for hours about this. So I'm going to shut up soon, I promise. But like, <laughs> it's just, it's like it, it's one scene after another that just kind of adds another layer to this unarguably horrible situation. Yeah. 
that nobody in that story is in control over. It's just, it just is. It just mm-hmm. is happening. And each individual is dealing with it in their own way. And all the way they, the way that they show each individual dealing with it, including Benny themselves, it, it's all so realistic to me um, t- for being a potential path that anybody could take while de- dealing with this immense level of grief. Yeah. Yeah. It's super, um, it's just super believable in every way. These are, yeah. it, you you might play this game or, you know, see this situation on a TV show or something like that. And you might think to yourself, like, you know, it's, 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 it's really, it's horrible that mom won't go in the room and, you know, see her sick, uh, her sick son. But right. it's, yeah. it's definitely not something that you can say, like, I would definitely not do that. Like that's, that's not right. a realistic, yeah. this is a very uh, normal thing. And, um, yeah. I like how you said, uh, like, so, so they are treating you like a kid and I, that kind of unlocked this kind of memory, like all of these scenes where you're getting dialogue and information about how people are handling it, they all happen with this mechanic where Benny closes his eyes and like, you have to keep, close your eyes and keep your eyes shut. Um, so you can listen to a conversation that's happening in the hallway mm-hmm. or a conversation that's happening in another room there's a there's a scene uh where Benny's dad is talking to his mom's boss and uh his mom's boss yeah. is being a dick about like why she's missing so much time at work and uh very kind of uncharacteristically so far Benny's dad kind of goes off on this guy and screams at him um yeah which is again it's a relatable understandable thing uh if uh you know someone doesn't have the kind of compassion and empathy to understand why you know she's missing a day of work Um, (laughs) right it's uh it's you you just really see how this is affecting everybody it's it's really kind of well played and we haven't even talked about how uh they portray it affecting benny yeah and like and that's that so yeah that that gets into a lot of a lot of different things like the like that that's that's another just another another box you can check of how believable it is like 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 she's an accountant like corporate culture does not stop because right. her her son is sick and that's so fucked up and that she has to deal with that on top of everything else and then then her husband just trying to be there for her in the only way he knows how and freak it out on this guy you know what i mean like which probably doesn't really help like in the grand scheme of things just the boss could be like how come your husband's yelling at me like but like the, the, these are these people that are in an impossible situation that are just trying to navigate it in a way to be there for their child and for each other. Like it's just so believable. And then, like you said, you, it gets into how how is it affecting Benny? Yeah. Um, and and these scenes I think are some of the most affecting and 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 uh, I can't say relatable because I have not gone through anything like this, but the way that the game represents the disease and pain mm-hmm. is so well done and haunting and affecting i think about like so i mean i I, again i'm not trying to take over take over the show but like basically the like like you're in bed and you're sick and you'll be talking to your parents about or sometimes your dad or your mom about different things and then the disease will start to like take hold essentially and Mm -hmm. these like like lightning bolts of red lines uh like kind of like kind of come into the screen and your vision starts to kind of darken and in certain sense certain cases your parents are like no stay with us benny or no hit the button for the medication benny they like, like mm-hmm. and and you have different ways of trying to keep the sickness at bay and for a while it's working and right. then slowly over time those little red like you know lightning bolts or whatever you want to call them the, basically the physical the uh visual representation of the disease Right, like kind of coming closer and closer, and then as expected, it gets to a point where you you can't fight them off anymore. Yeah, and holy shit, man! I mean, like, ah, yeah. uh, it was it. It had that that thing of like when it was starting to happen, like when that last one happened, like, and you knew that this was the last one, but you're still like just as the player trying your ass off to fight this thing off and just uh-huh. knowing that it's not knowing you're going to lose the battle because you yep. know it you're already on the boat you know what i mean yeah, you don't exactly. win you know where this story's going at this exactly point. yeah and oh man that some some of those scenes were i mean they're they're just they're they're uh, 
they're so unique and un- unlike most things you see in video games. Yeah. And and they and they and they impacted me in a in in that way. Um it it, it I think about them frequently. Yeah. And not in a not in a traumatic it, they traumatized me way just in a like just such an it was just so effective the way that it's like a it's like a, a great song gets in your head or the way that like a the the right scene from the right movie just like sticks with you it's just like those scenes are just just like they're they're wild they're yeah. wild so i was thinking like th- i don't i don't know it must have been very difficult it must have taken a very good creative mind to figure out how to visually and uh like um audibly represent pain uh and disease in right. this so like yeah. those those uh the red squiggles on the screen the big yeah. the ball of pain um yeah. it also comes with this great um kind of humming like throbbing mm. sound effect yes, uh, that plays absolutely yeah and as it gets worse and worse uh that sound starts to dominate what you can hear and the ball mm. of pain dominates the screen too uh so at the beginning uh, you have your medicine, you have your orange juice, you have a sandwich, uh, you have your mm. morphine button. Uh, I don't know if it's morphine, but I'm. It's the drug button, you know. Yeah, the yeah the the painkiller button or whatever. The, right. Yeah. Exactly. And so at the beginning, you get that. Uh, you get the red ball. You know, kind of faint humming in the background. You eat your sandwich. You take your medicine. You press the red button. It goes away, and you're like, okay, cool. And then the next time, uh, it doesn't go away. It just gets smaller. And then the next time you try to take your medicine, but it melts away and you you can't take it. And then you press the button, the button does nothing. And then yep. the next time you barely, you, you struggle to move your mouse. It kind of, mm-hmm. it slows down your mouse uh, cursor speed way down. So it it gives you this through just some simple gameplay stuff. It gives you this incredible kind of experience of being weak and uh uh, the by this point the the ball of pain the the humming is it is overwhelming and you get th- by this point you know like okay yeah this is it like you said before it's um yeah and man it's just like and i'm like you too this this part where the the disease is uh progressing and getting worse and worse this is like i i just think about this like f- kind of if i detach myself and think about like just how they just so masterfully represented this in a video game where mm. you're you're still blinking and stuff you're still doing that so you're still connected to it but it they they really thought about what is the best way to represent this in all uh inputs visually with sound yeah. it's yeah. it's really really good and it's like you get to a point here where i start crying both times i played this yeah. uh and what happens when you start crying is you blink uh, yep. to try to get tears out of your eyes and yeah. uh, that just just reinforces this and uh sucks to say this is a point where my my webcam stopped functioning at one time oh, but yeah. i can imagine i can't remember how the game sets it up but i can imagine a situation and i got the full impact of this even with even with some this is a horrible time to exit out and go into the calibration screen right um, but <laughs> right, yeah. that happened the first time I was playing. The second time, it just kind of registered my blinks three out of every four times, so I didn't have to recalibrate. Mm. But I can imagine a possible scene where things start to speed up. You're going through the scenes quickly, more quickly, because you're blinking more often, uh, because yeah. I was crying during this scene. It, it's uh, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah, it's the... I was sitting at the I was sitting at the table that I was talking about upstairs and and just like I was as much of a wreck as I can remember a video game making me. Um it it was it was hitting every emotional center that I had. Um and and it's all because of the reasons you just said. And I'm not just I'm not just gonna restate everything you just said. Because it is the visual, the sound, the the mo- the the controls, the all of it. But just that it took the control away. And this mm-hmm. entire game is about controlling it with your eyes, right? You blink, you look, you blink, you look, you blink. And it's amazing how great that works, like a lot of the time, even though when if you have some technical difficulties, it's like, wow, it really can see my blinking and it really reacts to me and I'm moving things along and I'm doing and I'm this. And then to have all that control just rested away. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a master stroke of really, 
effective and emotional storytelling. And again, I use I use this term before, and I'm not trying to repeat myself. It's just it just it earns it in a way that most games just don't. It just it it felt so real. Like it just it it's hard to explain. Um, and I don't want to talk in hyperbole. It's just but it's just it's so strong, and the connection you have is just so there that describing it even as I think well as we're doing it now it doesn't do that that feeling justice of when you're going through it because like it because it was I was tearing up I was on the verge of crying crying at some point the first time I played through it I was like I was you know on the verge of sobbing I was a wreck I was a wreck and Mm -hmm. um and it felt just so potent and uh and it, it's an absolute testament to the way the game's designed because yeah. you're not even the most effective books and movies that I've read and watched didn't get me to this level of feeling like I was there, you know, and and that that is something special to me for sure. Yeah, this is something where like only video games can give this level of like immersion is a stupid buzzword that like every open sure. world game is called yeah. immersive at this point. Yeah. Some yeah. of them, some of them feel that way, but this, this part right here, this is immersion. Like yeah. it's coming at you from all angles. It is uh it's just a, like you said, it's a testament to game design, the thought that went behind this, like everything that's happening is serving this like single emotional moment that's happening in the sure. story yep. everything yep and it builds to it in such a way that that it's it's just it just compounds its effectiveness as, as you're building up to that scene mm-hmm. um yeah and then when and then when you you know your your mom gives you the typewriter right and you got to type out the story of your life and mm-hmm. you so you write the story of all the things you're going to do and that kind of ends up being the story that you told the boatman right you know and um and and just this work of fiction that is your life because essentially you're just this kid whose life's being taken from you completely yep. out of control no control at all everything's being taken from you and and there's nothing you can do about it besides go through with it and mm-hmm that just it just it just hit it just hit me like a Mack truck in the exact way that they meant it to and it's something i still think about on a regular basis there's a couple of moments um as you're working with that typewriter too where you see how this is affecting benny like be- even before you get i think this is before you even get to the part where you got the red ball of pain on the screen mm-hmm. uh where benny starts out like you said he he writes down the fictional you know, totally dream version of his life. Um, Mm. Then the next time he has the typewriter out, he writes down, uh, and I wrote this quote down, he writes down, Benjamin Brin was a loser. He didn't even try to fight the disease inside of him. He just laid down and died. And when I saw that, I was like, Jesus Christ. Like, okay, now we're seeing like, like Benny's a little kid and this is how he feels about himself. And they, they've worked so hard throughout the game to give you this connection to Benny. You I mean that hits really hard. I'm getting chills talking yeah. about this right yep. now too. Mm-hmm. And that just that's another way to, to connect with the player, just because I, I mean maybe there's someone out there who has perfect self esteem. I don't know, but there's there's literally I don't think there's a one of us that can not identify with that feeling, right? Mm-hmm. Of just being whatever, regardless of the situation, whether it was justified or not, whether it was your emotions or anxiety playing tricks on you or whatever. And, and, but like, of just feeling like, like you're the worst and you can't do anything right. And you're like, that's, that's a real, that's a, that's a real human emotion that almost every human being goes through. And to see that kid that you are, but that kid type that out on paper and have it sitting there staring you in the face, literally in the face as you're, yeah, that's uh, it's just it's it it it's it's so real. It's mm-hmm. it's just such a real thing. And why? Of course, if you're in that situation, that's the way you're going to feel at some point because you're going to go through all the stages of that grief from losing your own self and losing your life and 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 things that I have no knowledge of personally. But it, it just feels like that that of course would be a a a, a stage of that, right? And. And that's that's another thing too, right? So like we're talking about all these different points, and 
every one of these points, I, I struggle. There there are some aspects of this game that I think could be better. Like, I think that, like, some of the control stuff could be better. And I think that um, there's certain segments that, in, especially at the beginning of the game, uh, especially the second time through, knowing where it went, that, you know, maybe were just a little unnecessary or could have used a little bit more fleshing out, a couple, like, like the beach trip when you're a baby and stuff. I'm not sure if I really need that or, like, things like that. But when I think back on this game, I'm not going to remember any of that shit. You know what I mean? I'm going right. to be remembering these moments we're talking about. And, and it's just the, 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 the amount of times that it hits the right way, just overweigh any other, and the rough edges and all this stuff, it just, it smooths them all out. You know, you're, you're looking at this game with hindsight. And it's just like, it, it just, it had those moments outweigh anything else that the game has to offer for me. And hundred percent. Yeah, it's just it just it just does it does it so well um that it's hard to remember the flaws. Yeah. Of which there are, admittedly there are some. It's just sure. I I don't know. It's just it's yeah, hard I mean, to I separate like them. I said before, I I had technology problems that totally broke the yeah. immersion a few times my especially right. my first playthrough and like so that that's something that would detract from the story. And even if I had replayed this game again and had the same issues, I would still want to come on the podcast and talk about it uh, because of what this game is doing. Um, but it just right. so happened that the second time I played it, I got myself in a better situation, technology and light lighting wise, you know, yeah. um, where it, it did work uh, as intended. So yeah, for sure. I did get the full thing. So I guess like the last kind of, well, the end, the end. So yeah, I'm I'm really excited to talk about this. I've been yeah. I've been doing my best to to keep my mouth <laughs> shut about the goddamn end of this game, just because that. Oh, okay, go ahead. Sorry, I'm done. Yeah, I'm waiting. <laughs> it's um, you know, we we normally on the the show we normally don't go beat by beat through the story, but since this yeah. story does have just moments along the way that I want to talk about, it does kind of work out that way. But we're at the end now, uh, where you have gotten, you know, you get the scene uh, where, so it's kind of, they show both of them at the same time. You're going to see the gatekeeper as Benny is dying and they, mm -hmm. they switch between the two scenes and uh, the gatekeeper is your cat, uh, which is cool. Mm -hmm. uh, the gate, yeah. Maybe the gatekeeper can just take whatever form is, um, I don't know, r relative to the person that's going up there or something yeah. like that, but. I really that like cool. that idea, by the way. I thought that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's a cute cat. Uh, so, yep. <laughs> and I, I, I actually, I don't know. I, I think I'd rather be judged by a giant dog when I'm. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Cats are way more judgy. Yeah. I want a dog to look at me and be like, yeah, I want to play with that guy. Get him in here. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, you, you go up to the gatekeeper and you get these, these two scenes um, kind of switching back and forth, but the whole time uh, you, you come in and uh, like, mom is coming in and she's telling you this um, kind of version of the story. Right. And um, I can't remember. Do you, is, do you write this beforehand or is this something that mom is making up? I, if I remember correctly, um, I believe that mom is reading the story. Right. Um, you know, that like, you eventually came around to it's either came around to writing or one that she wrote for you. I can't remember what she is reading it. That's all I can yeah. remember. I can't, I, I'd be, I'm probably messing up some of the minor detail yeah. there. I actually think um I in my memory I think that you actually after you're done calling Benny's done calling himself a loser, he does write this kind of um recounting of his life here and mom comes in and reads it. And so it's switching back and forth between like the uh wolfman telling the story to the gatekeeper and then your mom telling it to Benny as Benny is uh laying in bed. Um mm. And this is like, you know, the ball of pain thing caught me emotionally in a big way. This is like the, okay, the waterworks are on. I am like tears rolling down my face. Yeah, you're while primed. Yeah, This is exactly. a extremely powerful uh, voiceover here. It's, it's uh, man, it, it's incredible. Mm. And that story that she tells is kind of repeated word for word basically by and almost like exchanging lines with your coyote ferryman to right. the gatekeeper and um and it kind of just paints the story of this like seemingly unremarkable kid 
that was remarkable to his family and to life and to the world in his own way. Mm-hmm. Like that an on pa- on paper is just a pretty normal kid, but just like the way that they impacted the people around them and the kind of the attitude they had and, and the way that they went about their existence was remarkable in and of itself, uh, which is just such a beautiful idea anyway. And, uh, and yeah, and the gatekeeper listens to the story and you're kind of back and forth and I'm, I'm like warbling like an idiot the entire time with tears streaming down my face. And, and, um, so yeah, so you go through this whole scene and then the gatekeeper judges you and decides that you are worthy. And, um, well, at least you believe that that's what you think. Um, at least the way they conveyed and the game tells you to close your eyes. Yeah. And, <laughs> and and did you peek the first time? Uh, the first time, my first time, uh, my webcam wasn't working, so Son I was. Son of a bitch. Yeah, yeah. But I don't um, remember what I saw because the second time I had my eyes closed. Yeah, so I I didn't see anything. All I just uh, I peeked once and it just said keep your eyes closed. Basically, is what it said. <laughs> and then you clo- close your eyes and you just keep your eyes closed for. But I think it's an undetermined amount of time. It, it after a certain amount of time, it just waits for you to open your eyes, and then you open your eyes and it's kind of got that stars going by you and the title screen f- uh, splashes. Yeah, and like you you close your eyes and the the credits roll while your eyes are closed. Yeah, yeah, it it's something else. I that moment, and again, I, I'm not going to speak in hyperbole. I'm not going to say best video game ending of all time or anything like that. But I mean, in in recent memory, man, like that that moment when I opened my eyes and it just said the title of the game and it was that was the end and just that that literal crossing over moment to get to experience that in that way was just I had a like I was crying but I also I had a smile from ear to ear somehow at the same time it felt positive it felt mm-hmm. rejuvenating in some way while also still being like really sad and obviously all the things that are wrapped all the emotions wrapped up in that story but yet this it still felt like winning somehow like I I don't know it was something special that mechanic where they ask you to close your eyes and keep it keep them closed gives you because you're not looking at anything all you can do is listen and think yep. about what's going yep. on and this last time when you close your eyes the the dialogue ends and like like you i wasn't quite sure when i needed to open my eyes again so i just kept them shut enjoyed yep. the music listened yep. and just kind of like reflected on what just happened and it, it's so many games I finish where it's like, okay, the credits roll, I get that, you know, the end of game trophy. And mm-hmm. uh, I start, I go to take podcast notes or I um, yeah. Yeah. I go to my uh, tracking website and I mark this game completed and I see my playtime. Mm-hmm. With this one, it is forcing you to just like sit still, think about what just happened because uh, yeah. you don't, don't know when you're supposed to open your eyes again. And I, again, thematically, like this is when Benny dies, uh, Benny's eyes are closing at the same time. It gives you that same kind of thing. And there's this yeah. this final uh, line from Benny's parents um, that's just really sweet, uh, where as he's dying, uh, they say, why is he smiling like that? He must yeah. be someplace he likes. Yeah. And I was like, that, ah, good, good for God, Benny. That, yeah, that that line. Um, I I think about that a lot. I think about the end of that game a lot. Yeah. Um, and... So obviously, like this is something something I get criticized for on the Kane Rins podcast all the time. Uh, <laughs> for people that listen, is that like I like a lot of things. I I very rarely am talking about things I don't like. I mm-hmm. um and that's by design, honestly. I, if I there's a game that I don't like, there's a there's a game I've been playing recently that I really fucking hate, but I don't post about it on Twitter because I just don't want to post about stuff I don't like. Um, right. So just like so, people just the, the the sense that I'm just like kind of this outwardly overly positive person, which is which is maybe true in some ways, maybe not another, but. The fact that I came out of this game and I just had to sit in the goddamn chair for a minute and just collect my thoughts and just think about the experience of it in this short window, the short time frame. And just like you said, just let that music kind of wash over you and just kind of like be there and exist and be present in that moment. Like when I when I open my eyes and it said before your eyes and I'm kind of sitting there like like I had none of that. Like I when I beat uh, a game I loved, Infernax, I just beat it the other day. Loved that game. As the credits were rolling, I was like getting up to get pretzels. You know what right. I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, I beat the game. I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah, I did. And I went up and got a snack. Like, 
Like this was not that at all. This was like this was a a a full experience that it that it took me still taking me time to just kind of unpack how I felt about all of it. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, it just even in the medium that I love, you don't get these experiences very often. Yeah. Like yeah, and this is and the and like you said before, like this is the medium obviously we both seek out. This is not a typical experience. No. Um, definitely I, like not. I, <laughs> far, very far from it. And um and yeah, I just I I still th- I think about the ending of that game, and I, I just recently read, and I'm pissed at myself because I g- gave it my number two game of the year last year, uh, and I put some anime bullshit over it, which I still love, by the way. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, just I was thinking about the ending of this game, and just like wow, like like that was the mo like one of the most uh like emotionally affecting moments I've ever had in any form of pop culture, and it just like it just. It, there's nothing quite like it that I've experienced. Yeah. Yep. It's uh it's it's a totally unique thing. It's something that only a game could give and it's something that only yeah. a very special game uh, could give you even when you're talking about uh video games as a whole. And so like 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 I said before like some of my favorite games ever are, you know, like uh, Bloodborne is one of my favorite games ever. The Dark Souls mm-hmm. series as a whole is just, it, I hold those up so high in the world of video games. But I mean, this is, Before Your Eyes is something that, I'm not not to say it's better, but it's a, it's a completely unique experience that no game totally. has given me before. Even games that, absolutely, even games that I play and get emotional while playing like uh mm-hmm. like near automata uh that story mm-hmm. yeah, gave, me so, gave me some emotions uh the, the ending of that game but this is i mean this is this this game is wild how just perfectly everything fits together in two hours like you don't yeah. you don't spend right? 40 yeah. hours getting to know these characters uh yeah. which is what some games do to give you those uh, big emotional moments i just finished yakuza like a dragon i played yeah. that for 55 hours and i it was. It has a very emotional ending to it, but it's sure. Yeah, it's. It doesn't have the same emotion that before your eyes does. That's that's actually. It's funny because I was making the Yakuza joke before, but you're right. Like that that ending the Yakuza Seven affected me too. Like a very emotional ending. Um, mm-hmm. I was very attached to those characters, but a lot of the reason I was so attached to those characters was because I had spent fifty five, sixty, whatever, how right. many hours <laughs> getting to know. I knew everything about Ichiban, right? So like, so like, because of course I did. I spent that much time with him. And but you're right to get to this level in that amount of time is, is, is it's different. It's a whole. It's a completely different thing. Mm-hmm. It is. It is still a video game. It's a. It's a game that you play and experience. But it. But it's not. It's just. It's so its own thing, and that, I guess that's that's really cool too because that almost justifies the mechanic even more because we talked about it way what feels like twenty years ago when we started the show like we we talked about how that mechanic was like you know like is it going to be gimmicky is it going to be like used efficiently is it going to be something <laughs> that you play for ten minutes and they're like haha well that's neat. And and it just it's none of that. And to accomplish all of that in this tight package is just like it's almost kind of impossible. I, I might be ripping off Jacob Gell here by saying that it's like it it seems an impossible task that they just just decided no, we're just gonna make it work, and it just ends up being one of the coolest experiences you can have. Like it's mm-hmm. it's an impossible task made possible. It's just uh, it's, it's 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 pretty. It's it's an incredible thing. If you think about it oh. that way, in the span of two hours, um, like assuming you play it in one sitting, which I did my second time, which you said you mm-hmm. did uh, too, in the span of two hours, you go from, okay, let me check out this gimmicky blinking game to uh, having one of the most emotionally affecting things that any <laughs> yeah. piece of media has ever given me. It's, it's <laughs> wild uh, to yeah, think about it that was... way. <laughs> that was a much more eloquent and way fewer words <laughs> than what I said, but you're absolutely right. Like, Because it's just... The, yeah, it, it got from it got from point A to point B in such an effective, tight and emotional way that that nothing that nothing I can think of in recent memory or even maybe in any memory has gotten close to. Yeah. Um, and that's that's wild. I mean, it's just like that. Like, it's just literally unprecedented for me personally that that something like that was able to accomplish that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, this game. Yeah, <laughs> something else. There, there. Like I said before, there are other games that have made me cry. There are other games mm-hmm, that sure. um, 
will make me cry uh, in the future. I'll play a couple more this year. I'm sure uh, games yeah, affect sure. me emotionally in a way that you know a TV show just doesn't anymore. But you know, it's yeah, before your eyes is a special one, and so I think we're just continuing to repeat that at this point. So I think we should wrap this up. <laughs> um, but no, let's talk. Let's let's congratulate each other on both being right for the next half an hour. Yes, we are both right. This game's incredible. Yeah. Um, no, I um, uh, no, you're you're 100 right, and uh, and I just um, I re- I really wanted to thank you for not just asking me to be on the show, but asking me to particularly be on this show because, um, as as you know, as someone who listens to Kane and Rince, there's no way they'd let me talk this much about uh, about the <laughs> moments in the game that mean this much to me. So mm-hmm. I want to say thank you so much for letting me uh, letting me do that because it's uh, yeah, it's a it's a special one. Yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for agreeing. And like like I said, like it's it's cra- like you and I have just connected over this experience that we had. And you are literally the only person I know who's played this game. Yep, I've never talked to anybody about it. I I in fact I sent it out on the Kane and Rinse Slack when I finished it. That this game was incredible, and I got a lot of oh yeah, I'll get to that. And I never right. heard back from anybody again. You know, so yeah, exactly. Um, and you, this is the kind of game that if someone did get around to playing it, you would hear about it, right? So yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So when I saw you, you, you posted something on Twitter on your game of the year uh, thing, and I was yeah. like, I should ask Brian if he wants to talk about it because I don't know. I could do this by myself, but I want to talk to somebody about this game. Yeah. You know? no, so this game, yeah, that, it, yeah. And I, I'm really glad you did. I appreciate it very much. Cool. Well, thanks for coming on uh, the show, everybody. Once again, listening, uh, if you've made it this far. Good for you. And uh, go check out Kane and Rince. Uh, go check out uh, Brian's Twitter and Brian's blog. Look in the uh, show notes for links to all of that stuff. And yeah, thanks for listening again. Please uh, support Tales from the Backlog in any way that you can. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, tune in next time for the next game that comes out of the Backlog. <laughs>